we will see for what and we'll start at 10 to 5. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning, everyone. My name is Farhan. I am one of the co-directors for Choices Ahead Project and will be your moderator for today. First of all, I would like to welcome all of you today to the first part of Tutors in Action first ever online workshop, Choices Ahead Introduction to Pre-University Programs. The purpose of this workshop is to assist all of you SPM graduates here today in choosing your most suitable pre-university programs before embarking on your undergraduate degrees. So do not hesitate to ask any questions that you have on your mind as our speakers will be answering them at the end of their presentation. I hope that at the end of this workshop, you will gain more insights on the different types of pre u programs that will be presented. Before we start, I would also like to mention that we will be live streaming our workshop in Tutors in Action YouTube channel. You guys can check out our YouTube channel and also you guys can also join uh, here via Google Meet. Some rules and regulations uh, throughout the workshop. Uh, participants are required to mute their mic throughout the session except for speakers who will be presenting. Everyone are encouraged to turn on your camera so that we can see your face. Okay. Uh, feel free to ask uh, questions on our Google Meet comment section, YouTube live chat session, and also you could scan our QR code uh, later on the next slide uh, for QA sessions also. Another thing is please ask questions politely and be mindful of your words. Do not use any inappropriate uh, words, okay? And most importantly, enjoy the workshop.
So we will now show you the QR code where participants can scan uh, to ask questions later on. Okay, I think uh, we could uh, skip to the next slide. Don't worry, this slide will appear again later on. So some uh, programs that we will be presenting and discussing today. First, we have Australian Matriculation or SMAC, uh, met, uh, Matriculacy under KPN, ASASI under the Public University or better known as IPTA, Foundation from the Private University, A-Levels, International Baccalaureate or IB, we will have American Degree Transfer Program, ADTP. The next two would be from the accounting side. We will have ACCA and ICAEW. And lastly, STPM. So without wasting more time, this is the brief presentation agendas that we will be discussing. So it consists of all of these points that the speakers will uh, present later, yeah? So I would like to start up by introducing our first speaker, Natalie Chan from MCKL, who did OSMED. So Natalie, you can start. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Natalie. I did OSMED back in MCKL uh, last year from January 2022 up until November 2022. So I'm currently learning German language because I'll be doing my degree in Germany. Yeah, next. So today I'll be talking about a brief introduction of OSMED. Uh, OSMED is basically the short form of Australian matriculation and it is an internationally recognized preview program. And in simple terms, you can consider it as the form six or year 12 of Australian students. So in Australia, there are a few types of Form 6. There are WACE, W-A-C-E, SACE, S-A-C-E, V-C-E, and etc. But OSMED uses the curriculum of WACE, which, is, which stands for Western Australian Certification of Education. Next. So the entry requirements to do OSMED will be you need to pass SPM, O-Levels, IGCSE, or equivalents with a minimum of five credits, including English. And this is the pathway of OSMED. After your secondary school, after SPM, you will do OSMED for one year, and then you will pursue your undergraduate degree in either local or international universities. So the duration for OSMED, there are two different types. Uh, OSMED takes up one year, and the intake will be in January, February, or June, July. And OSMED prep, also known as extended OSMED, will take up five months plus one year. And the intake is usually in October, August or September, but the intake months depends on which college you go to. So for example, back in MCKL, the intake will be in January, but in Sunway, the intake will be in February. Yeah, next. Okay, so this is the brief like uh, timeline. If uh, on which intake you will join. So if you join the January intake, as you can see in the first block right there, uh, you will start in January and you will graduate around November. Your results will come out in around Dece in December. So actually, OSMED is not only one, it's not just one year, it's basically like just 10 to 11 months like this. And if you join the June intake, you will start in June and finish in around April or May. And for the OSMED prep, uh, as you can see in the light pink boxes here, these will be the additional five months where you actually do the year 11 curriculum of Australian students. And then in the dark pink boxes, you will be doing the actual OSMED program. So let's say I got, I got my SPM results in June. And then after I got my results, I can start with the OSMED prep program. Then from August to December, I will actually be relearning what I've learned in SPM, but it's the Australian uh, curriculum. And then in January, I will officially start my pre-U program, which is the Form 6 one. Yeah, next. Okay, so the assessment method for OSMED is 50% internal assessments and 50% external assessments. So this is very different from SPM because SPM is considered as 
uh, assessments in which your final marks are accounted from your final exam, not your midterm exam or whatsoever. So this one, the 50% internal assessment includes topic tests, quizzes, assignments, investigations, and research. So during your entire OSMAT year, you will be given some tests or like lab uh, experiments in which you need to uh, carry out in class. It's, it's just like a very short test. Lah. And then these marks will be accumulated. And then at the end of the year, you will also do a final exam. And then your final result, your final marks will be based on the internal assessments and external assessments. So let's say, because I did chemistry in OSMED, so in chemistry, we had some lab experiments. So the teacher will give us lab experiments and then we will need to uh, carry out the experiment by ourselves. And then the teacher will evaluate on, on our experiments and see whether or not the experiment is successful. So for example, if my experiment is successful, then she gives me like 10 out, uh, 20, uh, 10 out of 15 marks, let's say. And then, uh, in the final exam for my chemistry, uh, for my chemistry subject, I get, uh, let's say I get uh, 70 out of 100. Then 70 plus 10 will be 80, so it will be 80 out of 100. It's something like this. It's so your final marks is basically a combination of both internal assessments and external assessments. Next. And this is the estimated cost as of this year. So I compared MCKL and Sunway because I think these are the two main institutions that offers OSMED. Of course, there are more institutions, but these are like the most uh, dominant institutions. So MCKL, the uh, cost is ranges from about 14K to 18K, and for Sunway, it's about 19K. But uh, do apply for scholarships because you get a lot of bursaries and discounts. And I know that Sunway offers a lot of uh, scholarships as well, and it would greatly reduce like your college fees. Uh. So yeah, do apply. Next. Okay, so as the tuition fees I listed here, 14K to 19K, these were the numbers that were in the previous slide. But for the miscellaneous fees, registration fees, lab fees, resource fees, deposits, and external exam fees, it greatly depends on which college you go to. But the rough estimated total fees will be about 23k to 26k. And the cost varies depending on the institution you decide to study at. And also one more thing is that if you study an art, if you study like art subjects, you don't actually require to pay lab fees because you don't use the lab. So art uh, art subjects will be uh, cheaper than science subjects. So it greatly depends on your subject combination as well. Next. Okay, so these are the subjects listed. Uh, these are the subjects provided in OSMED in Malaysia. And these subjects also depends on which college you go to. For example, uh, this subject might be offered in Sunway, but not in MCKL or vice versa. So the subjects here, we have English, English as an additional language or dialect, mathematics applications, mathematics methods, mathematics specialists, chemistry, human biology, biology, physics, uh, accounting and finance, applied information technology, business management and enterprise, economics and psychology. So uh, some people might get confused on what's the difference between some of these subjects because they look kind of the same. So I'll, I'm going to explain a few. So for English and English as an additional language or dialect, there's a difference. English mainly focuses on English literature. So you do a lot of readings, a lot of um, analysis, a lot of writer's effects on the text and movies that you have done in class. So it's a lot about like uh, literature. La. So if you think you're really good English, you can choose this. La. And then for English as an additional language or dialect, uh, in simple terms, it's EALB. It's like the simpler English where it's a lot of comprehension work. And uh, you also do a lot of Australian history in this subject. So if you think your English is not that good, and then you can choose EALD because it's actually easier and it will help you later on in your final marks, which I'll explain later. And for math and for the three maths you can see here, mathematic applications is something like the modern maths in SPM. It is like the, uh, it's easier maths and then it revolves around a lot on data, research, matrices, growth and decay, etc. And maths methods and maths specialists is something like ad maths where there's a lot of algebra, lim, x and y. So if you really if you really want to, if you really think you're going to add maths, you should uh, do maths methods or maths specialists. And as so of what I know, if you want to, be, if you want to do an engineering course in the future, maths methods and maths specialists is compulsory for you to take. 
and mass applications is the easier one. Uh. So if you're doing a course such as like biochemistry, you don't require a, a difficult math, so you can just do mass applications. Next. So for the subjects, you need to select five subjects from the list I showed just now, but only your four best scored subjects will be accounted into your total marks. So next, this is, this is an example. So as you can see on the left side of the picture, uh, this student did physics, mathematics, methods, English, human biology, and economics. So the best four scored subjects are physics, mathematics, methods, English, and human biology. So these four marks will be accounted into your TEA, which is the, uh, your, your total score of your marks. And then these marks will be compared against other students who did OSMAT. And then uh, the, the system will give you a rank. And this student achieved an ATA of 85.00. This means that this student has, uh, has done better than 85% of the students who did OSMAT. So I have to emphasize that OS, uh, the ATA is a rank, not how well you have done in the subject. So uh, unlike A-levels or other pre-university courses, you are given like A, B, C, or D, and this shows how well you have done in that subject. But ATA is not, uh, it's not like that. ATA is how well you have done against other people uh, who have did the exam. Yeah, next. So this is the recognition of OSMAT, and in the recent years, OSMAT has actually gotten more and more well recognized all around the world, other than just Australia. So yeah, you guys can take a look and see whether or not there's any places that you want to go. Okay, next. So here are some pros on whether OSMAT is right for you or not. Uh, if you want to study in Australia, OSMAT is the shortest pathway. But even if you don't study in Australia, OSMED is still the shortest pre-university pathway because it only takes up 10 to 11 months. And you can also get used to the Australian curriculum earlier, and this acts as a stepping stone for you to enter Australian universities. Of course, MUFI is also an option, M-U-F-Y MUFI. But then, uh, from what I know, like, it only offers a direct pathway to Monash University in Australia. But if you do OSMED, you, uh, you have a lot of choices uh, in Australia. And secondly, you excel better in the 50-50 assessment system and can commit to being consistent and hardworking throughout the entire year. So if you feel that uh, during your schooling year in secondary school, you do better in your mid-year test or your uh, uh, mini test throughout the year rather than your final exam, then I think that OSMED is something that you could try because you are good at the internal test rather than the final exam. And this will also like reduce your stress on your final exam because you have accumulated marks throughout the entire year. Number three, you're still unsure of what to study and want to keep your options open. So as I've said in the subject combination just now, you have to choose five subjects and you can choose both science and arts as long as you have five subjects. So if you don't know what to do in the future, you can, this is a good option because uh, if because you have science and arts, arts subjects. So if next time you want to do arts, you can still do arts. If next time you want to do science, you can also do science. So yeah. And number four, lower cost as compared to A-levels or IB or other pre-university, uh, or most of the pre-university programs. OSPEN is relatively cheaper like, based on uh, the fees. Yeah, thanks. Cons or why is OSPEN not for you? Number one, you excel better in the 100% assessment system and tend to find difficulties being consistent in your studies throughout the entire year. So I think this is quite self-explanatory. If you think you do better in your final exams as compared to your midterm test or your mini test throughout the year, uh, you shouldn't do OSMED because uh, your marks need to be accumulated throughout the year because it's the 50% to 50% system. Secondly, limited resources. So the demand for OSMED is considered low as compared to other pre-university courses such as A-levels or IB in Malaysia. So then the teacher experience in this field is uh, quite low. So I feel that throughout my entire year in OSMED, it requires a lot of self-studying and self-motivation to uh, keep yourself going. And an example of like self-motivation is that you need to take the initiative to look for lecturers, to ask for consultation sessions, need to search online for 
lots of information because the lecturers will not be spoon feeding you and like uh, giving you notes on every single detail that are taught in class. Number three, race is relatively easier as compared to other curriculums such as BCE, SAIS, so it might put you in a hard spot in university. So I have a friend who's currently studying in Australia after she graduated from OSMED. And because OSMED uses the curriculum of race, she said that it was a bit difficult for her to catch up with the other students in Australia who have done stays of VCE. So, and she's like a top student in OSMED. She got a really high ATA score. So if she said it, it puts her in a hard spot when she's in Australia, and if you want to go to Australia, this might be something you want to consider. Uh, you just need to put in more effort when you're in Australia to catch up with the other students. Uh. So uh, bear that, uh, keep that in mind. Number four, for those who want to study music, law or accounting or any specialized fields in the future, OSMED is not recommended because the subject doesn't go as deep as a foundation course. So I did accounting in OSMED as well. And the knowledge of the accounting subject taught in OSMED is very shallow as compared to ACCA or uh, any accounting foundations. Next. Okay, words of advice. Uh, consistency is key. Treat every single task seriously. Task is the internal exams, the tests. And don't cram your homeworks and revisions because some lecturers might pile up all the tests within several weeks and it's going to be hectic. So um, uh, basically, this, uh, the internal assessments, the lecturers will tell you the date, maybe two weeks before your exam, before your mini test and then you will have to prepare for the test. So it's quite last minute. Uh. So if, if you have five subjects and if all the lecturers plan to last minute tell you when it's your test and if all your tests uh, lies on the same week, it's going to be very uh, hectic for you. So try to do your revisions consistently throughout the entire year. Okay, number two, set reasonable goals each month. So this is quite related to the first point. Uh, you should set reasonable goals. I mean, this is quite self-explanatory. Like, try to like target yourself on what chapters you have to complete in this month uh, and how many party papers you should do this month. Prioritize your studies and encourage one another. So lastly, have fun and enjoy your college life. So after OSMED is just around one year, so do take up leadership positions, participate in clubs and make friends, you know, put yourself out there and just get to know people because you don't want your college life to be just studying every single day. Even though I said consistency is key and you should study uh, consistently, uh, also do not neglect your social life because uh, that is part of the college experience. So yeah, that's, that's about it for me. So any questions? So now we will be having a, a Q&A session. So participants are free to ask questions in the comment session or you could scan the QR code uh, presented there. Okay, I think we have one. Uh, does the school provide any support or guidance or uni application for OSMED students? Uh, for the school, are you talking about your secondary school or I oh, think oh, you mean like you meant the yeah, college yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah they do they for antique yeah, they do have like an international uh like uni uni uh what's it called department where they will help you apply for schools overseas or you can do it yourself also like, I'm not sure about Sunway but I'm pretty sure they do have that department as well okay I hope that answers your questions so any more questions? Uh, I don't see anything in the comment also from the YouTube. There's also no comment. Okay, so if there's no more questions, uh, thank you, Natalie, for the sharing. Yeah, I hope uh, the participants who's interested in joining OSMED has gained some insights regarding the program. Next up, we will have our second speaker from Matriculacy. Uh, I would like to welcome Lina Shazana to present about Matriculacy. All right, thank you, Farhan. Uh, hi, my name is Lina Shazana Putri Binti Hashim. 
I, uh, you can call me Lina. I am a matriculation student currently studying in College Matric Class in Johor for session 2022 and 2023. So during SPM, I received AAs and I decided to learn for metrics, although I actually got my application accepted for uh, science in UIA, but I decided to go for metrics. And I currently will be interviewed for matriculation scholarship uh, under a program we call as PPC, uh, which is Program Pelajar Cimelang. So next slide. So I will be talking about the brief introduction of matriculation. And uh, uh, next slide, please. All right. So in matriculation, we have two types of program. Uh, the first program is the one-year program, which is consists of two semester, and the next, uh, the second program is two-year program, which is consists of four semester. So one-year program in matriculation is actually roughly ten months, and actually less than uh, roughly eight months. I'm sorry. Uh, and during those eight months, you have, uh, for eight months for one semester, you have like eighteen weeks of studying, one week of study week, and one week one week of exam week, and it went very fast so you don't really have to worry about the time so for the one year program uh, is actually for both account and science, and science stream and for the second year program is actually only for science stream so if you ever apply for accounting in matriculation uh, you will be accepted into one year program only for one year program uh, next slide please so in matriculation we have two type of assessment method the first one is PB and the second one is PSPM. So PB stands for Pentak Siram Berterusan, which like uh, consists of UPS, which is like a quiz and then practical tests and assignments. And PSPM stands for Perperiksaan Semester Program Matriculasi. And these uh, two assessment methods and combined will accumulate to become your final grade. So for PB, uh, they will take 60% of the final grade and PSPM will take 40% of final grade. So in matriculation, we only sit for an exam at the end of the semester. And throughout the whole study time, we will have PB that consists of UPS, uh, objective, and then practical tests for both science and accounting students and also assignment. So practical test is like a lab test. You will be tested on how you handle the experiment and the lab report. And the UPS is like briefly what you learn in lecture. So they will only ask like about uh, 15 to 20 objective question and it will be done in Google form. And during UPS, you will be do it individually, but most of the time we will gather around and discuss about the questions. So it's actually easy for you to get full marks on your UPS. So for assignment, uh, for assignment, we have two assignments for maths and one assignment for each science subject and for accounting also. So I'm not really sure about the account subject, how they tested based on the assignment. But for me as a science student, uh, we have to we have uh, individual assignment and this assignment also included a uh, group assignment and uh, group assignment and individual. So like if most of the time it is individual assignment and group assignment only for mathematics. Next slide, please. Okay, so for matriculation, actually matriculation is a very, very cheap uh, program. So like if you ever planned uh, to go for a very short and affordable financial program, you can go to matriculation. And when you, uh, in matriculation, the fee that the estimated cost that I show here is actually total out with everything. Like if you have to take from red, we have to take from red to apply for local university. So it is included here. So you don't have to pay like separately for your MUET. And here they also included your lab manual, lab code and other um, fee as well. But here estimated cost does not include your tuition fee or your um, hostel fee. So basically in metrics, you don't pay for the Uran Pengajian and Uran Penginapan. And for the estimated cost here shown, uh, they say that uh, they have uh, professional accounting. But professional accounting only is in College Metro Classes Lango. So if you ever plan to take professional accounting, please do apply to College Metro Classes Lango because there is, that is the only place that they offer for professional accounting. And the rest of the College Metro Classes uh, Class all around Malaysia, they only offer uh, account biasa than science too. Next slide, please. So uh, in matriculation, so if you are a science student like me, 
I am science hayat student and in metrics kita ada three type of uh, science which is science hayat, science computer and science physical. So science hayat you will be taking all the science subjects which is biology, physics, chemistry and mathematics. Tapi kalau you ambil science computer, you akan ambil biology, science computer, chemistry and mathematics. While untuk science physical, you takkan ambil biology but instead you ambil physics and also science computer. Uh, but uh, here, uh, everyone cannot drop chemistry. You must ambil um, chemistry. So everyone in science, uh, science student in the college ambil um, chemistry as of all uh, in ambil um, chemistry. So the accounting, you will take account subject, pengurusan perniagaan, economy and mathematics. So mathematics, accounting and mathematics science are berbeza because mathematics science is actually harder than mathematics accounting which is makes sense because account itself have dah ada melibatkan uh, calculation so that's why their mathematics is easier and for in matriculation also we have additional subject or compulsory subject but this subject will not be calculated to your final grade so untuk you punya CGPA nanti at the end of the semester bila you got your result you only counted you punya subject yang you ambil macam science I take science so dia akan ambil uh, dia akan calculate biology, physics, chemistry and mathematics also mathematics je. But the compulsory subject wajib untuk semua orang ambil. But you will not take these four subject untuk setiap semester. English is compulsory for both semester but hukum, pengajian, uh, moral and Islamic study are not compulsory. So right here, uh, right now, I am currently on my last semester here. I'm currently on my study week. So my second semester actually I ambil pengajian, um, then Islamic study. And my during my first semester, I ambil koko. So you don't have to take all these four subjects at the same time except for English. Next slide, please. Okay, so for um, matriculation punya certificate, to be honest, it is not that strong compared to kalau untuk, uh, in terms of like locally, it's not that strong compared to macam uh, diploma ke. So kalau if you ever think of applying a job after you finish matriculasi, uh, I'm not going to encourage for that lah. But if you, the matriculation certificate is valid for local university of course and also private university but if you ever plan to go outside the country trying to further your study overseas then you go, can go to countries like uh, United Kingdom, Australia and New Zealand but not all the university that accepted matriculation certificate uh, some of the universities like University of Melbourne, Canterbury and Birmingham and the reason why um, I also listed for this university is that because we have matriculation at the program biasiswa, dia akan hantar pelajar ke luar negara to this country. They also, uh, they will come back here as a lecturer. So they send the students, the scholarships, the scholars to United Kingdom, Australia and New Zealand to this country. So that's why the matriculation certificate is valid there for them to pursue their study there. So next slide please. So the pros of matriculation is that the very first thing you guys can realize is it's a very fast track. It has a really short duration of studies compared to other, compared to STBM, compared to SSC and compared to uh, foundation and also diploma. It really has a very short duration of study. So that's why kalau you want a very fast option, you can go for matriculation. Second is it is affordable because there is no tuition or hostel fee and you really pay only for what you need then you can go for matriculation lah sebab sangat-sangat murah for the URAN and if you are qualified to get an allowance which is 95% of matriculation students are qualified to do uh, are qualified to get allowance you will get 250 ringgit per month and ni diberi oleh kerajaan lah atas dasar untuk membantu pelajar-pelajar yang susah so the third one is you have many choices. So because cut matriculation is actually not going far from your high school, from SPM. So bila you still unsure about what, what you want to apply or what you want to pursue during your undergraduate studies, then you can go to metrics because you can see what you are interested in and you can see that you actually can apply to many courses but they're just general do. So kalau you ambil science pun, you will apply to TESOL in the future. The Fourth is, it's easy to score. 
if you get full marks on your PB, you only need half of your paper marks, your half of your PSPM, untuk to get an A. In matriculation, we have this term of like, you are not going to fail. Kalau you fail, that's mean you really, really teruk. The lowest grade in matriculation ada sampai like EF, which is not going to happen. Sebab kalau your PB 60%, then it's actually a C. C macam C, C plus macam tu. So kalau you dapat C plus when you punya result keluar waktu uh, final exam, that's mean you don't work hard on your PSP lah. That's mean, uh, so that's why it is really hard for you to fail in metrics. But it's also easy at the same time. Sebab kalau you tak work hard on your paper, then you only get what you do for your PB lah. And if you you score full marks on your PB, then you only need like uh, half of the or half of the marks of the paper. So one paper untuk PSPM is 80 marks. And you only need 40, 40 marks out of 80 marks to get an A. As easy as that to actually score an A in matriculation. Next slide, please. So the cons here in matriculation is actually first, very high competition to get a place in degree. So if you ever think of like macam applying for a very high demand course, you have to expect the worst that you might not get your first choice. So, but you have to compete with an ASASI, STPM, foundation, and also diploma as well. So you don't really, and matriculation is like very much and sangat, sangat simple compared to these other courses I mentioned, which is ASASI, STPM, and foundation. It's sangat, sangat simple. And kalau you trying to go further into macam science, you will realize that into if you want to plan to go further untuk science degree, you realize that metrics ni hanya belajar sangat-sangat basic je. So that's why the reason kenapa I rasa macam metrics ni cons je lah in terms of you punya syllabus lah. So the second is uh, you need to catch up fast with learning materials. One chapter can be done in a week or two and for my chemistry this year actually we have 12 chapters and 12 chapters need to be done in 18 weeks. So one chapter cannot take one or two weeks. If during SPM you are used to your teacher macam take time, slow down to learn, to teach you one by one, in metrics tak macam tu. Imagine having to learn like one semester worth of 12 chapters. So it's really impossible for you to rely on lectures and your tutorial class only. And it might be difficult for you to cater all subjects as one, especially if you are slow, uh, if you are slow learner like me, you have to rely on self-studying and so on. And the third one is, it's hard to get opportunity to join activities outside the college. So if you guys realize that because matriculation can, the cut satu college of matriculacy, they are 2,000 students. So these 2,000 students need to compete to get a place to join activity or competition outside the college. So they will only choose like selected students and it might not be you. Kalau you rasa you pernah uh, keluar sekolah, always participate what to do sekolah rendah, uh, what to sekolah rendah or sekolah menengah. In metrics, it's not going to happen like that. So, but only select students sahaja yang akan keluar, then represent the college. Uh, next slide, please. So, is it right for you? Is matriculation right for you? Uh, if you want to take a quicker route to degree study, yes, I encourage you to take matriculation. If you are cost conscious, conscious about your studies, yes, matriculation is for you and if you are not sure i'm sorry there are typo there if you are not sure about your future degree course matriculation is for you because it will let you take time to look into what you want to pursue in the degree and if you are self-initiated with your study metric is for you because i realized that when i in metrics i cannot really depend 100 percent on the lecture and also on tutorial class i have to go and consult my lecturer i have to ask my friend around i have to do my own studying and it's really packed because at the very same time you have to cater all the four subjects and you have to cater the assignments and the projects for other compulsory subjects as well. So if you think that you cannot do that, then I don't think matriculation is for you, but you can try. You can always try, you can learn. I have friends who get like six A's during SPM, but in metrics, they got for flat during first semester so it, it I think it's all depends on you and your lecturer might be really really helpful so next slide please so my words of advice as matriculation student is that first you have to find the right circle I think this not only for matriculation this for other P 
be in your skill program as well. Find your circle that people who can motivate you to do your work and study. Because uh, I think that this is really important. But you cannot do everything before your final exam. You must do it before we earlier than your final exam. Because if you try to cram everything at once, it is hard. So I think it is better for you to actually find the circle that can, uh, you can do your work together and actually learn. And the second is participate in the college program. So if you ever go to matriculation, I do advise you to participate in college program to know a lot more people, to get more chances in the upcoming college events. So I try to, I went to volunteer under my biology club in matriculation and I actually got to participate in the event a lot more because I get to know um, the people that trying to find person for the upcoming events. So I think this is how you try to join and actually participate in the college event. And the third one is keep on track. Keep on track about your study. Try to avoid uh, try to avoid procrastination and try to be efficient while you're enjoying the moment. Do your work on time. Uh, ask your lecturer if you don't know. Ask during a tutorial class where you're going to discuss tutorial question. And this will help you a lot. This will, this will help you to cattle all subjects. Even if you're not studying, not really doing self-studying at the moment. And last but not least is always reach out. Ask when you don't know a question. Ask when you cannot catch up. And whether it comes, whether you want to ask help from your friends and lecturers, don't ever like trying to study without asking people who actually pros in that one topic. Try to do like group study or try to like, even if you're trying to like self-study, ask your friend who are much more pros in that one subtopic you are trying to study. So next slide, please. Uh, so that's all from me. If you have any question, you can ask me. Ask me. So uh, the first questions we have here from the comment, uh, we do the comment session first. Uh. Hi, in what condition will I be able to get chosen for PPC? Any criteria from Q? Okay, so uh, when I apply for matriculation, uh, when I apply for the PPC, they say that minimum requirement is 3.75 for your first semester result. So if you get like 3.65, you are not actually qualified for it. And this 3.75 is very, very important, especially if you want to apply for PPC untuk science subject. PPC will have like, we, they will send student for subject, science subject, biology, physics, chemistry, and mathematics. And they will also send student to TESOL uh, at UM. So the requirement is 3.75 and you have to be a uh, student in second semester for first year program uh, for one year program and the fourth semester student in two year program uh i would like to say that i actually got my i actually for my first uh result for my first semester result i do not meet the requirement 3.75 i have uh, i got lower than that but i'm not really sure maybe because of the course that i applied is castle so it's they might be brilliant on that so but eventually i get the interview to go for that so but very first thing i would like to see you must get 3.75 it is better if you get four flat for your first result yeah that's for the first question okay we have three questions here on sliders the first one uh, what preparation have you done before you apply for matrix? Is COCO achievement important? Okay, so for this question, it's quite, um, <laughs> I don't know, I'm not sure how to say. So, matrix. So, my preparation before I go to matrix is actually just studying for SPM. So, about bila you buka, bila you buka permohonan to matrix, you just apply for it. You don't need to go for like, you don't need to prepare uh, you have to go for physical preparation, mentally physical uh, preparation, no. You just apply for it, just like you apply for UPU. So, but metrics, there is this like controversial thing where um, walaupun you punya SPM dapat 7 A's or 8 A's, you might not get accepted into matriculation. Even you get straight A plus pun, you might not get accepted into matriculation. It just goes random. So, 
you can't really macam you can't really say that I need to get straight A plus to go matriculation. I need to get straight A's or I need to get even four A's je nak pergi. It's just random. It really based on your luck. I think uh, is co curriculum achievement important? I don't think so. I don't think so that co-curricular achievement is important for you to get into metrics. As I said before, it is just a random je. So, kalau you try to put sangat-sangat um, penting ke curriculum pun, don't do so lah. Because matriculation, they don't look at that sangat. So, yeah. Let's hope for the second question. So, next one. Is metrics hard to apply? Like, what's the common requirement? Um, Metric is not hard to apply. You just apply there. And the common requirement, okay, the common requirement here is that you must be science students or you must be accounting students. Either one, because they offer both program on that both subject. And the common requirement here is that a long time ago, uh, they need you to get additional mathematics untuk pergi metrics. Tapi uh, since I think my batch or the batch before me, you only need mathematics here untuk masuk dekat metrics. So, tapi untuk kalau you tak ada additional mathematics, you akan rasa sangat-sangat susah untuk belajar mathematics dekat metrics because they will go further into more deeper into different uh, differentiation and integration and vectors and so on. So, kalau you tak ada additional mathematics, you akan rasa lebih susah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Next one, uh, if you are going for PPC, are you going to be a lecturer in the future? Slay, congrats. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, yes, if you, uh, if I pass my interview, I will be, I will be, I meet my degree for four years as usual. Then I will come back to matriculation college to jadi lecturer. So basically, kalau you dapat PPC, you sebenarnya, you punya future tu dah menjanjikan you ada pekerjaan sekarang because I know that one thing you worry about is not try, not getting a job so if you go for PPC then your future is secure lah basically. Yeah, that's so the last one, uh, how's life or environment different in metrics and uni? Okay, I get this a lot. I get this a lot even from my junior. Um, ada beza dia banyak. Dekat metrics, they do not go far from high school but dekat uni uh, for like asasi ke I think um, a bit far lah sebab first environment ni uh, asasi dekat university and like kalau you depends on that is like uh, metrics tak jauh sangat daripada high school tak jauh sangat which mean kalau you are not ready to go like into university you tak fully prepare for that yeah can be difficult lah for you so uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is that matriculation is sebenarnya sangat-sangat senang and kalau nak ikutkan macam assignment tadi pun buka assignment yang macam susah-susah macam UST tak. Dia sangat-sangat senang. So um, dia perbezaan ni akan membuatkan you akan rasa macam a bit susah lah nak survive dekat university. Tapi other than that I think you're going to be fine. Uh, so yeah that's all for me. <laughs> Thank you, Lina. Thank you for the wonderful sharing and interactive session. I hope those who ask questions have got your answers that you want. Uh, next up, we will have uh, Tariq Ziad, who did Asasi in UKM and currently a degree student who will be presenting about his previous uh, pre-U program. Uh, okay. All right, everyone. So, um, my name is Muhammad Tariq Ziyad, with Muhammad Jahangir. Uh, you, can, you guys can just call me Tariq. Uh, I live in uh, Port Dixon, Negeri Sembilan. For my secondary school education, I went to um, SMK King George V. And um, I was able to get straight A's for my SPM back in 2018. Uh, I'm currently a third year computer science undergraduate at UKM. And I am one of 15 Maxi Stack scholarship recipients back in 2020. So that's just a bit about myself. Uh, moving on. So um, I'll be giving a brief introduction of uh, foundation specifically for the Asasi Pinta UKM Foundation because it is uh, uh, what my background is. Uh, 
However, I would like to give a little bit of a disclaimer. Not every um, foundation or asasi that is associated with IPTA is the same. So you're, you're not going to see the same uh, subjects for uh, asasi in UITM or in UNISA, UIA, UM, and so forth. So uh, moving on. In terms of uh, duration, uh, as as you pinta UKM is one year, you would have your uh, intakes in July or August of the current year, and the program would uh, end on June or July the following year. And the entrance application is uh, via the UPU website for application. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So um, in terms of assessment methods for the program, you would have uh, two types of subjects. You would have those that are exam-based courses and non-exam-based courses. So for the exam-based courses, you the allocation would be 10% for tutorial, 10% for quiz, 20% uh, for assignments, 20% for the mid-semester exam, and 40% for the final semester exam. And for the non-exam-based courses, um, uh, as the name suggests, there are no exams for these courses. Yeah, so the allocation would be 20% on assignments and 40% uh, on project one, 40% on project two. So there are quite uh, hefty allocations on those projects. So uh, moving on to the estimated costs. Uh, since it is a one-year program that is uh, separated into two semesters, the first semester you are looking at a registration fee of 665 ringgit. This is mostly for the uh, welcoming week, so the fee is for uh, you know re registration processing fees, your um, materials for the welcoming week, such as uh, your clothes, your lanyards and so on and so forth. In terms of academic costs, you are looking at 830 ringgit for the first semester. Accommodation is roughly 3.5 ringgit a day. Um, for the first semester, this will cost you around 500 to 550, um, give or take. College activities are gonna be 50 ringgit. So for the first semester, you are looking at 2,100 ringgit. Second semester is pretty much the same. Uh, of course, you no longer have to pay the registration fee, you're already a student. So um, subtract that amount, you would have 1,400. And for the whole year program, you're looking at 3.5K. However, this uh, the fees that uh, I have laid out here are not including the uh, associated cost material. So, uh, when you're looking at books, uh, reference materials, those are um, other factors to consider when calculating the total cost. So um, we're moving on to subjects. Um, UKM's foundation program is quite hefty for this particular part. Uh, I'll try. I'll try my best to explain it. Uh, currently, you're looking at. The subjects for the first semester, you're looking at biology one, physics one, chemistry one, logical reasoning, statistics, research skill, uh, language and literary appreciation, and of course, national identity development. So for biology, physics, and chemistry for the sciences subject, if you're wondering specifically what you're going to be learned, uh, I would suggest looking up AP uh, components of the subject. So AP biology, AP physics, or AP chemistry. If you're wondering what AP means, it's advanced placement. Uh, more often than not, the curricula in uh, UKM's foundation program is going to be the same as with the AP subject counterparts. And uh, moving on from the sciences subject, you would have your logical reasoning and statistics. Now, these are mathematically intensive uh, uh, subjects. So uh, these are in correspondence to your research skills. Now, if you look below the statistic uh, rule, you would have a research skill subject. Now, this is actually really unique for Asasi Pinta UKM program. So for the one-year program, you would have to conduct a research. Now, when I'm talking about research, 
um, I'm talking about article papers. If you've ever gone on Google Scholars and searched for review papers or uh, any such of research papers, you would have to actually uh, conduct a research during SP, during Asasi Pinta. And then uh, you would have your language and literary appreciation components. Uh, this is, you can treat it as a basic English subject, although it will not teach you anything uh, for MUET. You will still have to take MUET uh, in Asasi Pinta but the language and literary appreciation will not teach you any components of that. It is purely um, UKM's uh, version of English literature. National identity development is, um, is quite unique. It is one of the non-exam based courses. You would have to get out of the classroom a lot. So this subject is very intensive on projects. So you would have your humanitarian projects, which ranges from uh, helping out at orphanage, helping out at um, mass residentials. You would have your social experiments as well. So um, it's not uh, exam based, but it's definitely difficult in terms of you have to actively go out and do all of these projects. So um, all of this accounts for 26 credit hours for the first semester. And if you're wondering if 26 credit hours for the first semester is a lot or not, it is definitely a lot. Because even in degree programs, you generally don't go above 20 credits per semester. And you're looking at 26 credits for the first semester, which is very, very much uh, a number that you should be approaching. But it is what it is for the program. And so uh, moving on to this the second semester subjects so for the sciences subjects you're looking at a, continu a continuation of them you're looking at uh, ap biology 2 AP, ap physics 2 ap chemistry 2 and uh just to give a rough idea for each of those sciences subject you would have around 30 chapters for the whole year yes so 30 chapters is definitely a lot um the subjects are uh, much more, uh, much more um, explored and intensive than what you are used to in SPM. Um, in terms of mathematics, you only have one uh, subject for this semester, which is vector calculus. So this is going to be your uh, classical differentiation, in double integration, triple integration, algebra, and so on. And uh, the continuation from last semester's research skill is research project. So if last semester your focus is more on um, making a proposal of what you want to do for research, research generally falls into two categories. You can either do uh, questionnaire based or experimental. So questionnaire based, of course, you find a verified questionnaire you find uh, respondents maybe maybe in the hundreds, maybe in the thousands, and then you conduct research based off what they uh, correspond to your questionnaire. Uh, experimental research being, you would have to go to the lab, you have to conduct research. And uh, this is very important because um, actually, if you look at the course code, uh, if you look at the last digit of the course code, the last digit actually corresponds to the credit hours for that particular subject. And uh, if you look closely, the research project carries a digit of six, which is uh, quite a lot compared to the other subjects, which are three. Uh, and then there are some subjects which are four for the last semester. So six credits um, in your CGPA, it will definitely reflect a lot if you get a B or a B minus. So it, it will definitely drag your CGPA down. So I would suggest that if you are looking for uh, Asasi Pinta, you would be very careful with the research project subject. Uh, moving on to uh, critical analysis of current issues and leadership and decision making. So uh, these two subjects are also non-exam based courses. So 
you would have to do a lot of uh, leaving UKM's compound and just conducting, uh, like I said, uh, social experiments and uh, projects, uh, humanitarian projects. Okay, so uh, next slide. In terms of recognition, uh, without a doubt, if you are in the SSE uh, program for UKM, you will definitely be recognized by all associated costs available in UKM. Uh, that's a given. And also, you are also recognized by any institution and organization that recognizes local foundations. So it is not a problem for you to apply um, for JPA programs, MARA programs, uh, whether it be the uh, preparation programs or the scholarship programs or the loan programs, uh, it is not a problem. Uh, if you're looking to go abroad, there are options. Uh, you could apply for UCAS. If you're wondering what UCAS is, it's, it's just like uh, the international UPU system. Uh, I do have friends from the foundation program that uh, eventually went abroad for their degrees, whether it be in the US, UK, uh, Middle East, New Zealand, and so on. So it is definitely possible. But um, if you're looking to go abroad, I would definitely uh, suggest the more uh, clear route or pathways. Because uh, as I said, Peter, UKM doesn't really uh, provide that much of a platform for abroad studies. It is possible but not recommended. Okay, so next slide. So in terms of pros, um, as with any SSE program, uh, the first one will be early exposure to university life. So you are definitely open to explore university lifestyle and education. Um, if you are accustomed to boarding school lifestyle, there's no longer uh, lights out, there's no longer curfews or anything. Outside of classes and outside of learning hours, you're free to do whatever you want. You, you can leave, you can, you, you can go back home. Uh, outside of classes hours, it doesn't really matter. So you, you're free in terms of uh, lifestyle. So if you're an SSC student. Uh, the second one is the unique and comprehensive program structure. As I said, uh, the research project and research skill subject is actually very unique. You could even publish your research. So I've had friends that uh, are at 17, 18 years old, and they've already published their first papers, So, which is definitely a, a very big achievement for that age. Usually you'll be looking at master's students or even PhD students to be able to achieve that kind of progress. The third one is holistic approach. Um, as I said, there are exam-based courses and non-exam-based courses. So you will be uh, exposed to humanity subject as well as the STEM-oriented subjects. And the fourth one is uh, the program is conducted by experienced and expert lecturers. So when you're looking at the academic year when you're looking at the academic unit, you're looking at professors, uh, philosophical doctorate lecturers, uh, you won't be surrounded by uh, teachers, is what I'm trying to say. So um, moving on to the next slide. Ah, in terms of cons, uh, the first one, it is definitely difficult and challenging. As I said, the amount that you have to carry throughout the year, the workload that you would have to go through, as well as the research project, as well as the humanitarian um, part. Uh, you would also have to make a lot of videos, a lot of uh, explanation videos. And if I'm not mistaken, even the language and literary appreciation subject, you would have to, for each class, you would have to make like a 20 minute movie there will be a movie night, so it, it, it was definitely, uh, it's definitely a hectic uh, pre-university program. The second one is that uh, it requires great time management skill. As I said, uh, it's difficult and challenging, and thus it requires great time management skill because you're looking at so much credit hours and so much subjects in a semester. Um, more than likely, your schedule is going to be 8 a.m., all the way until 6 p.m. 
uh, it's going to be classes. It's going to be like that for uh, a while. It's going to be like that. for the first semester, you're going, you're definitely going to spend a lot of time within the uh, Pusat Pumatepita compound. And for the third one, uh, it is a long commute between accommodation and classes. So if you are in the ASPI program, you are either going to be allocated into College Christmas or College Pendeta Zaba. And if you're lucky enough to get KPZ, uh, it's definitely a long commute. So if you miss the bus, you are looking at 4.8 kilometers to get to your, uh, into your classes. So you would definitely have to take the grab, which then uh, have some external courses. So uh, it's definitely recommended that you pay attention to the bus schedules in UKM. If not, it's going to be very difficult. So moving on. So is it right for you? First of all, um, if you have a passion for conducting research, if you have a particular topic or title that you are really passionate about for a long time, and you've always been looking for an outlet to conduct this research, to, to publish your research, um, Access Beta is definitely a great place for you. You would definitely find uh, a lot of the channels and a lot of the options to explore that path. Secondly, if you're looking for a challenging program, as I said, the program is uh, difficult and challenging. But ultimately, in terms of building individual character, I would say that it is rewarding in the long run. Um, I'm currently in my third year degree uh, education, and I would say during the past three years in degree, it is still not comparable to what I had to go through to the one year program in ASPE. Um, thirdly, strategic location. If for some reason you are looking for an institution that's close to home, uh, UKM is quite nice because it is interconnected with all of the um, public transportation, you, you are connected via the uh, KTM, MRT, or if you live uh, anywhere near Bangi, Kajang, it's a good choice for you if you want to go to an institution that is uh, near to home. And uh, fourthly, you're able to cope in a highly competitive environment because Asasi Pinta is uh, a program that is adjoined with the Pusat Pemanta Pinta, which is the National Gifted Center for Malaysia. So you will definitely be, you'll definitely be meeting a subset group of people that have taken their SPM much earlier in life because the Pusat Pemanta Pinta program is different than uh, the standard Kemen Champion in Dika Malaysia. Uh, these students can take their SPM at like 15 years old, 16 years old. So you're gonna meet people in your batch that are going to be two to three years younger than you, but still be able to comprehend and uh, very much perform uh, at that level. So um, even the requirements for Asasi Pinta is, I think, a minimum of seven A's for SPM. So outside of the students that you'll be facing in the Pusat Pumata Pinta, you'll also be facing uh, the general students that have scored uh, very high on the SPM. So moving on. So words of advice, uh, I would I would say that firstly, you should really consider the course that you would like to pursue in university um, and really consider that pathway. So if you want to become a doctor, you will really, uh, I would implore you to explore uh, the pathways for you to get that medical degree education because um, in Ansasi Pinta, especially if you want to do medical degree in UKM, um, it's quite hard to get four flat in SP. Um, and I think the competition is um, the competition is definitely very competitive for the medical degree. So you, you'll definitely be up against other foundation students. You'll be up against matriculation students. So it doesn't look good on the results slip if you are against candidates that uh, have four flat in their uh, CGPA. E even though you're taking a, a much more uh, hefty amount of subjects, but at the end of the day, most, uh, most applications, they judge you by, the, by your CGPA and curricular achievements. So uh, secondly, 
uh, I would advise you to carry out a project that you care about. So uh, more often than not, students will be assigned a supervisor and more often than not, they won't have a particular title with them. So the supervisors will actually provide you with uh, a title for your project. And whenever that happens, you don't really care about the project because it's not really a title that you're passionate about. You're just doing this to get an A. You're just doing this to pass the course. And you, whenever you face a hurdle for that particular uh, project, you won't have the passion to go through, to drive through it, to see it through to the end because um, it's not something that you are interested in. Uh, thirdly, I would suggest that you would find a supervisor that is knowledgeable regarding your project domain. So if you're doing something that's uh, medical related, biologically re related, you would uh, you should be finding a supervisor that is proficient in biology. If you're doing something that's uh, mathematically intensive, you should find a supervisor that that is an expert in mathematics. And if you're doing something that's based in psychology, of course, you should find uh, supervisors that are proficient in psychology and in psychology subjects because uh, if you are conducting a research in sciences and you have a supervisor that is an expert in mathematics whenever you have a particular hurdle or challenge uh, your supervisor might not be able to help you that much because it's not uh, his or her particular expertise and whenever that happens you would have to reach for outside help outside resources and then you would have to find a mentor which is definitely a, a totally different story and uh, it's definitely not recommended since you're only doing the program for one year unless of course you're a phd student you would have three to four years definitely no problem for that and then fourthly find teammates that are cooperative a lot of the group uh, a lot of the assignments in sp are group related so i would suggest that you find a group of friends that are uh, trustworthy and just stick with them throughout the whole one year program because uh, if you get classmates or teammates that are uncooperative uh, uh, or sleeping partners uh, you're gonna definitely be stressed out for the one year program with the amount of workload so uh, moving on um, that is that's it for me so uh we're moving on to the q a session so we're moving on to the q a sessions uh the first one can we have the social links to our speakers today uh as for this social link uh if speakers uh you don't mind to share i mean not only Tariq, uh every other mm -hmm. speakers if you don't mind to share maybe your ig or your linkedin profile uh you can put down in the comment sessions there uh, yeah, sure. Okay. yeah sure. as for the question related uh is it compulsory to continue undergrad degree in ukm if i did asasi in ukm can i pursue my study in other ipt okay so this is actually a re this is actually a really good question um as of 2019 uh asasi pinta ukm is no longer a 100 percent feeder program so once you finish your one year program in uh, UKM Foundation, you have to go through the UPU system. So you can apply for other universities and you can also apply for UKM itself. But you are not 100% guaranteed a place in UKM for degree. There is an increase in likelihood, but you are not guaranteed. As for the question whether you can pursue your study in either IPT, it's not a problem because you definitely have to go through the uh, UPU system again. Okay, so the answer for that is basically you reapply the UPU, uh, UPU again after you finish your ASP. Any tips to manage time in UKM, Tariq? Mm, any tips? Um, I would suggest that if you, hmm, I need tips to manage time. It's actually uh, really dependent on the individual. Some people would uh, make schedules. Some people would try to get ahead of the subject. 
uh, they would try to study two to three chapters ahead so that they have some more room to make adjustments. Uh, but generally, um, I would suggest that you plan ahead and you uh, make a timetable or schedule. Uh, try not to delay your work because it is manageable. Uh, I'm not the best at uh, managing time, but I made it through the program. Um, I think that if you make a proper, if you make a proper timetable or schedule, you'll definitely be able to manage time in UKM. For overseas universities, does UKM offer university placement support? Mm. Um, they don't support you. Mm. You won't have any special benefits. However, you can definitely get um, recommendation letters from UKM lecturers. Uh, if you are in the foundation program, uh, you can definitely request for that. So there is a bit of uh, recognition if your letters are from uh, PhD lecturers. So uh, in terms of support, that's the only thing you're going to get. Mm, other than that, there won't be like any workshops or anything for the application. You will be able to get recommendation letters and referral letters from lecturers of UKM if you ask them. Mm, what's okay, the international uni oh, sorry. international university? What's uh, the international university system? Uh, I think it was UCAS, UCAS for UK's yes. university application system. Uh, similar to UPU from Malaysia. As for the US, it will be Common App. I hope that answers your question. I will put in in the comment session too. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, thank you very much, Tariq, for the sharing of Asasi Pinta. Uh, I thank hope you. the participants gain some insights on that particular program. Next up, we will have a speaker from Private University Foundation program, uh, Lee Rusin. So, Rusin, whenever you're ready. Hi, guys. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rusin, and I'm currently in semester two of my foundation in law program at Multimedia University in Malacca. So my experience and my sharing on this today will would only be limited to my experience at MMU. So I think I'll give a brief introduction of foundation in law. And after this, maybe I can also share a bit about how you can do your law degree and pathways to be a lawyer in Malaysia. So foundation in law is basically the stepping stone you need to do your law degree. So after foundation or whatever pre-U course that you've chosen, you'll either do three years of your law degree and then take one year of CLP, or you can do a four-year degree at either public universities or MMU Malacca. And then that four years includes one year of professional year, so you won't have to take your CLP. So after that, you have to do chambering or what we call pupillage for nine to 12 months. It's nine months in Peninsula, Malaysia and 12 months for Sabah, Sarawak. And after that, you will be a qualified lawyer. Yeah. So for foundation in law at MMU, it's one year long. It's three semesters. The first two semesters are 14 weeks. The third semester is a short one. It's only seven weeks. So it works in a way that you have 14 weeks of your semester, and then you get one week of study week, and then your final exams will be spread out within two weeks. So that goes on, and that's how that's how your semester is made up. That's how the whole foundation is made up. So for the assessment method, it's actually based on the subjects. For all the law subjects, it's 50% of your final exam, which is the one where you get one week of study week and then it's spread out within two weeks. And then it's 40% of coursework. The coursework is consists of 20% of presentation and 20% of project. Presentation might be physical, so you have to present in your tutorial class, or it might be a video presentation based on your lecturer. Depends on what your lecturer wants for that semester. And for the project, um, you'll get the question from your lecturer at about week six, week seven of your semester, and then 
you get a few weeks to do it and then all sub all projects will be submitted before the last week of your semester and then 10 percent of midterms your midterms are only for certain subjects some non-law subjects have midterms as well it will be on week six seven or eight of your semester but it also depends on your semester like this semester we had our raya break so uh, a lot of our midterms are on week 10 which is actually quite late so for other subjects like english it is 100 percent coursework so it'll be 50 percent of an essay and 50 percent of a video presentation there are other subjects like accounting and business where it's like 50 percent of coursework 50 percent of final exam yeah it's really dependent on the subject next please so for the estimated cost for the fees itself, it's 18,000 for the whole foundation. If you're looking to do your degree, your law degree in MMU as well, it's also 18,000 per year. But if you add on your accommodation fees, if your rental is like 550 per month, then adding up all the registration fees and all that, it's about 25,000 for your foundation itself. So next on are the subjects. For foundation in law, it's a bit different from other pre-U pre-U courses where you have um, the same subjects and you study those subjects for your whole course. But for foundation in law, you have different subjects every semester. So I think I can briefly explain on each subject very briefly. So for the first semester, you have six subjects, second semester as well. And both semesters, you have three law subjects, which are the first three I've stated. For the first semester, introduction to law, it's basically introduction to how you're going to be a lawyer, how you're going to study law, what pathways you're going to take if you want to become a lawyer, um, methods of legal study, how to read statutes, um, like Contracts Act, the book, the book is called the statute. So how you want to read it, how you want to understand the language itself, that is a whole subject on its own. For general principles of law, that is the only um, law, law subject in this semester because it's the only subject where you really be studying what you think a lawyer is studying. So it's the only subject where you get to learn um, the basics of contracts law, torts law, how you apply the law. Yeah. For the third one, Malaysian legal history, it's very much similar to Sejarah and SPM. You learn about federated, unfederated Malay states, which is Melayu, Melayu, uh, Negri, Negri, Melayu versus Kutu and Tidak versus Kutu, Malacca Empire, stuff like that. The only thing that's different is that you learn how all this history stuff affecting the legal system in Malaysia today. For the fourth one, computer applications, you learn Microsoft Word, um, Microsoft PowerPoint, Excel, stuff like that. You'll have to do a practical test for all of the softwares you learned, and you have projects, presentations, and a final exam for computer applications. It's actually very useful if you pay attention in class because you do need to use Microsoft Word for your law subjects, projects, and stuff like that. For critical thinking, it's 100% coursework. If you get good group mates and you do well in your quizzes, then you'll be able to get an A. For communicative English, it's 50% of an essay and 50% of a video presentation. And it's also group work. So yeah, it's very important to get good group mates. For the second semester, which is the semester I'm in right now, as you can see, the first three subjects, which are the law subjects, all have introduction to in front of them because as I said just now, foundation is merely um, a stepping stone for your law degree. You're only learning the basics of this stuff and you learn it in detail when you're in your degree. So for the first subject, introduction to politics and governance, you learn a bit about political science, different leadership styles, and you learn about the government and how these two are interrelated. For the second one, introduction to Sharia law, um, it's about Islamic law, you have to refer to the Al-Quran to answer questions as well. A lot of people say it's the most failable subject of the semester, but to me, I think it's fine because no religion will teach you how to do bad things. So as long as you can grasp the core concept of it, you'll be able to answer the questions for this subject. For the third one, introduction to criminal and constitutional law. Criminal law is basically everything about crimes, um, theft, robbery, murder, everything about that. Constitutional law is about like who gets to write the law, um, how elections are carried out, stuff like that. And it's also only introductory, although there's still a lot to study, still a lot to memorize, but it's not as detailed compared to SRA degree. For fundamentals of business management, you'll be learning about business, how to promote, how to market, 
you have projects and presentations for this as well. And you also have a final exam for business management. So you do have to study for these non-law subjects as well. You don't just play play. So for the fifth one, basic accounting for lawyers. Um, if you took accounting in SPM, according to what my friends say, it's easier to learn if you took accounting in SPM. But if you didn't like me, then it's actually quite tough because you have to learn everything within 14 weeks. And then according to my senior, the final exam for her accounting paper last time was even harder than her SPM accounting paper. So you do have to pay attention in class if you didn't take accounting in Form 4 and Form 5. Yeah. Last one, essential English is the same as communicative English. It's 50% of an essay and 50% of a video presentation. So for the third semester is these three subjects. Um, I'm not in my third semester yet, but I do know that I think English for lawyers is basically you learn some terms, some words that um, are for lawyers. Yeah. Next slide, please. So for the recognition, um, with your foundation in law, you pretty much know that you want to do your degree in law already. For MMU, if you do your foundation in law in MMU, you can still apply for public universities. Because I think the main reason why people want to do their law degree in MMU is because um, they don't want to take CLP. Because CLP is extremely hard and you need to have that certificate of legal practice to be a lawyer in Malaysia. But if you can't get into a public university and you're doing your degree in MMU, you can still um, you're exempted from CLP basically, yeah. But you can still apply to public universities with your foundation in MMU. But if you're doing like matriculacy form six, then it's not that easy to get into MMU because MMU may ask you to do your pre-U course all over again, which means that if you took A-levels or whatever pre-U course and your results are not ideal, then they may ask you to do your foundation in law all over again in MMU. So now we're going to talk about pros and cons. I want to talk about the cons first. The first one is definitely the cost. If you're looking to be a lawyer in Malaysia and you're looking for a more cost-effective route, I would recommend you to do matriculacy because it's significantly cheaper and you can apply to public universities such as UM, UUM, UKM more easily compared to a private university student. So if you're looking for that, then maybe don't do foundation in law. Maybe you can go for matriculacy. Because magic class is also shorter as well. And the next one is that foundation is a very specific route. This can be both a pro and a con depending on you. Because if you're not sure what you want to do yet, I don't think you should go into foundation in law directly because yeah, it's very specific. You're already geared towards doing your degree in law. Because I don't think you would do foundation in science and then study fashion design after that. Yeah. So now I'm going to talk about the pros. As I said just now, it's a very specific route, but then it can also be a pro because it gives you a head start to your law degree. And, and I'm speaking from experience here. So the one, two, three here is actually the elaboration on my point. The first one is that you have a more specific, you have more specific subjects compared to other pre-U courses. This is actually a pro for me because I already know I want to work in the legal field later on. So if I did matriculacy, I might be studying other subjects that are not that related to law. And with all these specific subjects that are related to law, you actually get an idea on how to study law. I was a science student in SPM, and right now studying law, at first it was a bit of a struggle because the way you study law and the way you study science is very, very different. You don't just do past your questions and then um, do a lot of studying. It's not just that. You really have to understand what you're saying to apply the law and you have to be very detail-oriented because minor details will affect, affect your marks in the end. So those are yeah, what you have to take into consideration. The second one is that you can participate in activities that will offer a glimpse of the legal field. This um, is if you go and participate in extracurricular activities. So if you're not merely just studying, then you can go and take part in co-curricular activities, activities under the Law Society, mooting competitions. If you guys are interested, I can explain a bit about that maybe. Yeah, if you take part in competitions, you'll be able to um, get a chance to experience how it's actually like to draft written submissions as a lawyer. And this leads me to my third point, which is you'll be able to mingle around with people in the legal world. For MMU, 
I feel like the law society is doing a really good job in, inv in inviting lawyers and judges to give us talks and seminars. And that's how you meet new people in this legal field. That's how you do your networking, especially if you go and participate in external competitions, external activities, where they invite a lot of lawyers, then you get to meet new people. And okay, the next pro is that the duration, it only takes one year. So it's definitely shorter than Form 6. I do have friends who took Form 6 and then went for a direct intake for MMU. But then um, Form 6 takes about two years. So by the time you get into your degree, you'll be one year behind your peers from secondary school. But then again, one year in the long run is not that long. So it really depends on you. Next, please. Okay, so I've been thinking on this for actually quite some time when I was doing my slides, but I really don't think there's one kind of person that's um, suitable for a foundation in law because I feel like all pre-U courses are hard. Every course is hard. There's something challenging about every course. So I've narrowed it down to five points. Next slide, please. These are the points which I think are not only important for um, foundation in law, maybe other um, courses also, but also when you become a lawyer in the future. So the first one is integrity. I feel like integrity is the most important thing if you want to become a lawyer, because if you don't have your own principles, you don't know what's right, what's wrong, you're just going to do the wrong things and the world will end up being corrupt. The next one is you have to be brave and courageous because in university, no one is going to tell you to participate in what competitions. It's not like secondary school, your teacher will be like, oh, there's this competition coming up. You can go and participate in it, you know, increase your cocoa marks. No one will ask you to do that in university. So you yourself have to take the initiative to ask your seniors, peers, um, what activities there are. And because at the end of the day, all these activities that you take part in, you'll be able to write in your resume, your CV, which will be very impressive when you're looking for a job in the future. And also be brave and courageous to ask questions when you're in the lecture hall, when you're learning new things. Don't be afraid to ask lecturers, seniors, or your friends for help. Because at the end of the day, this will be your job in the end. You're not just there to memorize and take your exam and pass. You'll be a lawyer in the future, so it's knowledge that you need to acquire. The third one is discipline and perseverance. This one um, is because... Actually, foundation in law is very, very is a very, very heavy course, especially also if you want to take part in co-curricular activities, such as mooting, you want to be, you want to take up positions in the law society, and you want to juggle your studies as well. It's actually very, very hard to do so. It's not impossible. It just takes a lot of your effort and time. And you really need to be very good at managing your time. I'm not the best at managing my time, so I'm still working on it, but you have to be very disciplined. And you, the most important thing is that you need to learn how to work when you don't feel like it. Because there are days where you have to work the whole day. Because in university, you don't have a timetable like secondary school where you go home at 2, eat lunch, take a nap, then you study until nighttime. There are gaps between your timetable for university. So you need to learn how to use those gaps in between to manage your time and to be able to get everything done on time. The For, for perseverance, um, I wouldn't recommend you to stay in a course you don't like, but if you know law is something you want to do, you want to take your law degree, then you should persevere through it. Because I know many times, um, most times people will feel like, oh, very tired. And if you know you're just being whiny, then take a break and persevere through it and you'll get through your degree. For the fourth one, analytical and problem solving skills, it's because for law subjects, a lot of it, Yes, there's a lot of memorization, but then in your exams, you need to know how to apply what you have memorized. If you cannot apply what you have memorized, there are actually no marks given for only memorizing what provisions you are using to apply to that question itself. So you need to analyze the question and know what they want and use your problem solving skills to solve that question. The last one is you have to be detail oriented because there's a lot of paperwork going on, especially if right now you want to um, have a taste of what it's like to do written submissions, how it's like to draft proposals for activities, which you will do a lot of as a lawyer. You have to be very meticulous about paperwork because one minor detail could cost you a lot. So I would say that foundation in law is for anyone, but not everyone. Yeah. 
So I have some words of advice that are also quite general. Maybe everyone can um, take this into consideration. The first one uh, was an extension of my previous point, which is to be brave. You have to take initiative. As I said just now, no one's going to tell you what to do. Especially in university, you have a lot of freedom compared to secondary school. So you really need to take the initiative to do things, manage your time. For the second one is to go at your own pace because and you shouldn't be influenced by your friends definitely don't be because as i said you're gonna have a lot of freedom in university a lot of friends will ajak you makan say oh let's go mama at this time like in the wee hours of the night let's go mama let's go chat um i'm not saying you shouldn't socialize because that's definitely part of the university experience but if you feel like you're very tired you feel like you need to finish your school work then don't be afraid to reject your friends Personally, I'm more productive when I'm alone. So definitely, there are many, many times where I turn down my friends. But I feel like you should make an effort also like in socializing. Maybe go out with your friends once a week. So it's not that bad. So for the third one, you should be your own person. So be independent, manage your time well, and work hard. And what you want will come. Because I feel like you need to work hard before you learn how to work smart. If you work smart from the start, you're going, you're doing all the shortcut ways, but you're not actually learning everything in detail. You have to learn everything in depth for you to know how to apply what you're learning. So definitely working hard is important. And the last one is enjoy yourself. Maybe um, university life can be mundane if you're only studying every day. Um, every day you're chasing after deadlines, doing projects, assignments, stuff like that. But you do have to look for fun in your everyday life, like small, small things that will make you happy. Yeah. I guess that's all from me. If you guys have any questions, you guys can ask. Thank you. Uh, we move on to the questions. Okay, the first one. May I know how is your class schedule? Like, is it very packed? Okay, for each subject, you have, for law subjects, you have one lecture a week and one tutorial a week. Lecture is two hours, tutorial is one hour. For the other subjects, it depends. Like for Sharia law now, we have two lectures a week. For accountings and business, we have two lectures a week. Each is two hours. So it actually depends. And you might not get the same class schedule as your friends because it's randomly generated by the system. So right now, my class schedule is like, there's like a lecture at 10 to 12 and then another lecture at two to four. It could be like that. Or maybe one day I could only have one lecture. Some days I could have four lectures. Those are what my friends are going through. So you have like eight hours of lecture per day. But then it depends on what you like. My friends actually like their schedule because they're um, having all the lectures in the same day. And then towards the end of the week, you can kind of relax. But I like my lectures to be more spread out. But for foundation in law and MMU, you don't get to choose your subjects and your timetable on your own. For your degree, you get to choose it on your own, but it depends on whether you boleh fight for that subject or not. Whether or not it's very packed, it's okay, it's manageable in my opinion, but there's a lot of projects, presentations, stuff to do after class. So you definitely get very busy. The next question is about your accommodation, whether it's included in the fee or do you have to find places to leave? You do have to find a place to live on your own. For MMU, they do recommend you on-campus and off-campus accommodation. My friends who live in hostel, it's actually very near the lecture hall. You could wake up at like 7.45 and still be on time for an 8 a.m. So that's hostel. I think hostel is also very much um, cheaper than off-campus accommodations. Off-campus accommodations, it could be like 550 for rental per month. And that's not inclusive of your um, um, water bill, electrical bill, all that. There's also, also I do know of some friends who rent houses on their own. So they drive to school every day. Yeah, but it's not included in the fees. Okay, and last question. Why do you want to study and pursue law? Okay, actually, um, I have a very long answer for this. But to make it very short, I feel like passion tak makan. For me, I feel like I have other passions in life, but I feel like I'm a realist. I don't, I don't think, 
I can be unrealistic on this because at the end of the day, you have to put food on the table. You have to feed yourself, feed your family. So I feel like law is the most realistic option for me to be able to feed myself. Yeah, maybe when I get enough money in the future, then you can pursue your passion. But law, I think is good because you don't have to be a lawyer once you get your law degree. You can be other things. My, I have friends who want to be a journalist in the future. Uh, I have friends who want to be activists in the future. So it depends. And for a law degree, you can do a lot of things. And it's also a professional degree. So if for any, by any chance you want to, you don't want to be a lawyer in the future, you want to pursue something else, but then you failed in that, you always have your law degree to back you up and it's a professional degree. So definitely there are things you can do with that. Especially like maybe you want to work in like um, Google. You can be a legal advisor in Google and Google is a big company. So yeah. Okay, and a compliment that, love that mindset you have on Sharia law. Good luck. So a compliment to you there. Thank you. So because, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, thank you, Rusin, for sharing about your pre U program. And to not waste any more time, uh, I would like to invite Joyton Fu, who will be talking about A levels. Hello. All right. So um, I'm Joyton, the alumnus of uh, MCKL, Methodist College Kuala Lumpur. And I'm also the current president of the Association of the Malaysia Alumni of International Science Olympiad, AMISO. So I'm also, I was also a Malaysia representative in International Chemistry Olympiad of 2022 and 2023. Okay, so um, for A-levels, right, generally it differs from person to person. Maximum you can take four subjects in most colleges and minimum you have to take three because uh, otherwise you can't go into most uni. So A-levels have like two semester, I would say. The first one is known as uh, Advanced Subsidiary Level or AS. And the next one, the second one is known as A2, which is the Advanced Level. So A2 is significantly harder than AS, but you have more time to study for your AS than for your A2. So this is the duration. There's actually two factors that will affect your entire duration during your course in A-level. The first one is which intake you choose. So it's very general, but from what I can find online and from my personal experience, there are those two kinds of intake. One of them is like more like a year one. So those are April intake and August intake. So let's say if I'm taking A-level in April of 2023, I will definitely graduate around May or June of 2024 or if i take my a level in august 2023 i'll be graduating in october or november 2024 okay so means that you only have around like one year to study if you choose april or august intake but if you choose january or june intake you have about one and a half year so let's say if i were to take the january intake means that i will graduate around like uh, june next year and then uh, if I take the June intake, then I'll graduate around like November next year. So you get to have more time to study if you choose January or June intake. Okay, so uh, majority of college in Malaysia actually only have like these two intakes option. So um, in general, it's around one to 1.5 years. But in other colleges such as KYUM, right, it's a little bit more special because uh, they actually offer two years of studies for you. So you get to, you know, have more time to study and prepare for eight levels instead of rushing everything in like 1.5 years or one year. Okay, next. All right, so um, assessment method for A level, right? So um, from a science student perspective, generally you can separate them into theoretical and practical. So in theoretical, right, more often than ever you have objective paper and subjective paper. So subjective papers are those kind you have to write, like your answer, and then there's like a marking scheme for your teacher to grade how much you can get from a particular question. Whereas for objective, it's just A, B, C, D. So for practical works, uh, it's a little bit more special because uh, as far as I know, like every A-level college, they do have labs. And um, 
every week in MCKL, there's like a practical session for every single size subject that you take. So for example, if you take chemistry, bio and physics, then you have each, if you have one lab session for each subject every week. So it is a very holistic education, I would say. So it not only focuses on the theoretical side, but it also focuses on the practical side. Now, when it comes to mathematics, you have subject, uh, you have the normal paper, which is like those uh, you will take in SPM or, you know, even like uh, STPM or foundation, you know, those kind of uh, calculation paper. But what's special about uh, A-level is that they also have two extra different kinds of paper, which is uh, statistics and mechanics. So statistics is more like about, uh, it's more towards like normal distribution, uh, Poisson distribution, this kind of thing, you know, how to analyze your statistics. Whereas mechanics is more towards uh, engineering side of things. It's more like uh, calculating the forces, the speed, velocity, and all these kind of things. So, um, whereas for other subjects like economics and uh, law, those kind of subjects, right, you also have like essay papers. So, this kind of papers, uh, from what I hear from my friends, are pretty difficult because uh, after all, the essays are kind of subjective to the examiner. So yeah, that one is definitely required more practice. All right, the next one. Okay, so uh, to be honest, A-level is very expensive. So uh, when you compare it with uh, other courses like uh, those that I mentioned earlier, right, it's definitely more expensive. Like the cheapest one, definitely you can find in the market is uh, maybe like MCKL. So uh, it's like 21,000 and 24,000. Now, um, these are the few like uh, prestigious local colleges that I can find. So these are the tuition fees that uh, that I can find on their website. Lah. So again, this is just the tuition fee. It doesn't include like your lab fees, your miscellaneous fee, or whatever other fees that your college might include. So give or take is around this number. Okay, next. Okay, so when it comes to the subject, right? Um, max, further max. So this one I have to explain a little bit. Uh, so what's the difference between max and further max? So um, max is actually more or less similar to the additional mathematics that you'll be taking in your SPM, but it has like more in-depth concepts. Lah. Like for example, in calculus, you'll learn more in your mathematics. Whereas for further mathematics, right? It's like a completely different realm of max. So in further mathematics, you'll learn more in-depth concepts on a lot of mathematical topics. And it's more suitable for people who want to pursue like, let's say a degree in uh, engineering, or even if you want to pursue like actuarial science in the future, then yes, further mathematics might be what you want to take. But I'll advise you, even if you don't take further mathematics in your course, you can still pursue engineering degree and actuarial science. So there are some people who think that, oh, you know, I just want to take further mathematics. And then after like a few months, they regret it and they drop it. There are a lot of these kind of instances. So further mathematics, yes, you can try if you feel like you're capable of doing it. But if you're not, then better just leave it aside and learn it in your university instead, right? Now, for those that are highlighted in asterisk, right? These are the subjects that are not offered by every single college in every single A-level college in Malaysia. So for instance, right, computer science is not offered by Sunway, but it's offered by MCKL. So history is offered by MC, is, sorry, history is offered by Sunway, but not in MCKL. So if you want to take history or like psychology or computer science, right, this kind of more niche courses, right, I would recommend you to do a little bit of research on which university offers you this kind of, uh, you know, courses before you even selecting which college you want to go to. Okay, next. All right, recognition. The good news about A-level is uh, it's worldwide recognition, internationally recognized. So let's say if you want to go to Singapore, you can. You want to go to China, you can. Hong Kong, you want to go to Germany, you want to go to UK, you want to go to US, all bullet. So there's one thing that's even more interesting is that you can actually use A-level to enter some of the Malaysia university, like National Malaysia University, for example, like UM. So this is definitely something that you can keep in mind. 
right, next. Okay, so pros. Um, like I said, right, it's being recognized internationally. And uh, the it's, it has fewer subjects because, like, let's say if you compare it with uh, STPM, right, then definitely have to take more subjects. Like, because uh, in A-levels, you are not required to take languages as your subject. But um, in STPM, definitely language is the thing that you want you must take. And uh, one thing that A-level uh, particularly emphasizes on is actually like uh, practical training. So you get to do a lot of lab work, right? Uh, no matter which A-level college you are in, because lab work is kind of a substantial uh, topic or even activity, right? Throughout your entire course in your A-level studies, okay? And last but not least, low grade threshold. So uh, one thing that is interesting about A-level is that, for example, right, let's say your whole paper is 100 marks. And let's say if you only get like 60 out of 100, you can still get A. And the reason for that is because, let's say if the paper for that year is very difficult and everyone gets like B, around 60 to 80, that kind of range, right? Then the normal distribution curve will shift towards like, the lower grade side. So means that you still have the chance to get your A star or A or B, even if you don't think that you do that well in your A level. And the reason for that is again, the, the way they calculate your grade is uh, by plotting everyone's actual marks into a normal distribution curve. And then they will just like select, okay, the top 20% will be A and then the mid, and then the next 20% will be B, something like that so on and so forth. So it's definitely easy to get like grades like A, B, or A star. You just have to practice a lot of past papers. Okay, next. All right, uh, the cons. Number one is definitely expensive um, because uh, yeah, it's actually a UK education. It's actually from UK education system, right? So it's definitely expensive, uh, under, totally understandable. And another thing that I need to mention about is the examination fee. So examination fee is not inclusive within your tuition fee. So if you need to pay for your examination fee, right, is I think it's around like 600, 600 ringgit or 600 pounds. Actually, I forgot. I think it's around 600 ringgit, like for everything. So um, number two is limited subject choices. So if you are those kind of person who is a uh, very hardcore, you want to study everything, then it might not be suitable for you because uh, maximum, they only allow you to take four subjects, unfortunately. But even though that's the case, right, you can still take other exam papers as a private candidate. So for example, let's say if, uh, because English is not offered, right, let's say in MCKL, right? But if you still want to take the English paper, sure, no problem. As long as you pay for the exam, then you can still take it, okay? Number three is stressful. So um, yes, I would say that it's, might, it's definitely less stressful like than STPM, but it's more stressful than Diploma of Foundation. And the reason for that is because if you are taking A-levels, right, a lot of things that you are learning is actually in depth, very depth, very deep. So everything that you study needs to be memorize and you have to do a lot of past year you have to keep on practicing 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 until you get like the accuracy that you want so it's definitely a lot more stressful than other pre-university courses and the last one is a language barrier so um of course right it's english uh, everybody knows english uh frankly i can say that because we are in malaysia english is one of the compulsory subjects that we take however the English in United Kingdom is, I would say, a little bit different from ours. So sometimes when you read the question, it might get a little bit tricky because uh, there might be small discrepancies that you didn't notice in their question and it will end up cause you to lose your mark. So this is definitely something that you have to be cautious of. And I'm pretty sure that your lecturer will tell you which part you should be you know, uh, more cautious of. All right, so um, is it right for you? Uh, number one, uh, definitely mentally healthy individuals because you'll be putting through a lot of uh, stress and uh, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, unpredicted circumstances. 
Uh, second one is uh, financially stable, of course, sorry, because it's expensive. So dedicated, hardworking, definitely. I think this applies to every single course that you want to study. And last but not least is study abroad. So if you want to study in, let's say, like uh, Singapore, US, UK, whatever, right? Especially UK, A-level is definitely the right choice for you. Because the thing about A-level is that they provide you like a very thorough and uh, holistic education, right? Such that it prepares you very well for your university education. Okay. All right. Second, uh, next one. All right. Word of advice. Again, do your past papers, all right? Because uh, the thing about A-level is that every single year, their paper is like more or less the same. I can't say that it's completely similar, but the answer is more or less the same. So if you do like five to six years of past year, right, you'll notice that there's like a trend of question that they ask and there's like a standard mark scheme for every kind of question they ask. So if you just do your past year, I can guarantee that you can definitely get A star. Straight A star, definitely no problem as long as you do your past year, okay? Now, however, with that said, right, I'm not encouraging you to memorize everything. You still have to understand the concept and then apply it according to the circumstance given by the question. Okay, so which brings me to the second study method, right? Don't memorize the mark scheme and understand the concept. This is actually a very common problem among people who study A-levels is that they think that, okay, I just do a lot of passes and I just memorize the mark scheme and then hubby's, okay, I can prepare for my exam already. But that's not the case. In fact, the case is that when you do your past year, you have to understand why the mark scheme is like that. And if you don't understand why the mark scheme is written in this or that way, ask your lecturer. Because there's a reason behind everything. So don't just memorize everything. Okay, understand the concept is more important. Now, third one is core curricular activities. So this one is actually a very important factor because when it comes to... Uh, registering for universities, like especially overseas universities, they need to see your core curricular activities. Okay, why? Because number one, it boosts your CV. And number two, you have things to write in your personal statement. And number three, when they want to interview you for whether for a scholarship application or university admission, right? You need to have something to talk about. So core curriculum plays a very important role. So I'll say that you can join a maximum of two organization or society. Like for instance, I joined as the orientation camp commander and I'm also a president of the Model United Nations Club of my college, right? So um, that definitely helps a lot in my CV, I was saying, okay? And another thing is of course uh, experience, right? Because when you go into uni, there are like more group works and uh, more projects. So if you don't learn how to communicate with people, how to manage projects with a team, during your college, then you still need to pick up that skill in your university. Okay. And number four, um, quit your relationship. Yeah. Having a partner is going to distract your attention from achieving a straight A plus. So um, this is definitely something that you can take as an advice. Yeah. Next. All right. Q&A session. Thank you, Joyton. I like your advice there. <laughs> so the first question we have here. You're doing chemistry for too long now. Mind to share what's the secret of learning chemistry and what's your best resources? Um, I'm, to be honest, right, um, no matter what you are learning, the number one thing that you must have is uh, passion, uh, the interest of uh, knowing more and uh, the inquisitivity, you know, to learn more about things that you are curious. So, I'll say that the uh, number one secret is uh, just passion, right? If you have a passion, then you would like to find out how everything works. And in the process, you'll gain a lot of knowledge, which you can definitely use, not just in your education, but also in your real life, right? So uh, my resource for studying chemistry is uh, some university textbooks. Uh, for instance, you can go and search like Organic Chemistry by Jonathan Clayton. I think this book Maybe is you could a very good. The comment session. Yeah. yeah, I think this is a very good book. Uh, not just for organic chemistry because uh, a lot of times, right, what this book introduces you is that how can you apply like organic chemistry in industrial in the industry side of things, right? 
So this is definitely something that if you want to be a chemist or a chemical engineer in the future, you have to know about this. So I think this is one of my best resources that I can share. Any other question? Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the comment section or YouTube and stuff. So right, if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to just ask there and we will uh, conduct another round of Q&A session at the end of uh, our workshop. Uh, next step, uh, we move on to our fifth speaker. I would like to invite uh, Sharifa Nordiana from College Marabanting to, to talk about her pre-U program, International Baccalaureate, or known as IB. Yeah, Sharifa, go ahead. Okay, hi, can you hear me? All right, okay, yeah, assalamualaikum. All right, thank you. Assalamualaikum, my name is Dania. So, um, brief introduction about me. I studied at SMK Damansara Jaya, if you happen to know that school, and happened to obtain 4A plus and 5As in my SPM. So, I'm currently studying in College Marabanting. I'm finishing up my studies here in about five days, and I, uh, after this, I have like a three month break before I plan to further in biochemistry degree in most probably the UK. Okay, next slide. So brief introduction of the IB program. Um, I think it's the least popular amongst all the previous here. Uh, it was started in Switzerland in the year 1968. And in Malaysia, actually we only have 18 colleges that offer the um, IBDP. So my college is one of them. So what this, what IB aims to uh, have in its students is um, we actually have the IB learner profiles, which you can see here, principled, open-minded, inquire, balanced, caring. So um, right from the beginning, we can see that IB is a very holistic pre -U. It cares, it cares. It, takes into account your um, your uh, other than your academics basically lah. so it focuses on other things as well so we will see how in the following slides okay next this I okay IB takes two years and is divided into four semesters semester one semester two semester three semester four so one semester if you divide 24 by 4 will be about six months uh, so yeah, six months of each semester. Okay, next slide. So what is this IB? Okay, IB basically, if you join IB, these uh, these nine things are basically what you're going to be busy with. Lah. So the first, we have the three cores, which is the non, not to say non-academic, is the, is the weird part of IB. Lah. So the three cores, first we have creativity, action and service. So um creativity action and service is where you have to do those three things like you have to do something creative you have to do something that um has action and you have to do service is maybe really we can equate it to much like, um community service lah. so you do have to um you have to indulge yourself in these three activities and then you have to write a report and in that report, you have to say what you learned. You have to reflect on um, uh, how this, how this, that, how activity, how the activity that you did helped you to become a better person. Uh, yeah. So, so it's actually abbreviated into CAS. So that's one of the core of IB. Next, we have theory of knowledge. So theory of knowledge is actually a subject. Um, it's a subject where you you study why you know what you know. Okay, so it's a bit confusing lah. And even in TOK classes, after TOK classes, everyone will be like, ah, what was that, you know? Um, so, for example, like, why, why, how do we know that the the tree is green? Because there's chlorophyll. So, why, why do we know there's chlorophyll? Because scientists, you know, discovered that there's chlorophyll. And then we study about how accurate is the scientist's uh, experiments in saying that there is chlorophyll you know so stuff like that so that really um is a very mind-boggling subject okay so that's tok and then extended essay is a mini thesis where you have to write a four thousand word essay about any subject of your choice actually okay so that's the three cores and then you move on to the six groups 
So this is your um, academic side. Lah. These six groups, meaning you have to uh, take up six subjects. So it, it has to be one of each group. So you have to take one of maths, one of science, one of uh, language and literature, one of language acquisition, one of individuals and societies, and one of arts. Um, so yeah, even if you, let's say, even if you are taking econs, for example, you still have to learn science. They have a subject for uh, called environmental system and societies. So it's like not pure science, but it's like you still have to have a science amongst the six subjects that you take. Okay, so that's a brief intro about ID. Next subject and next slide. Um, assessment method. Okay, so um, from what I heard just now, A levels you have like A, A star, B. Um, Osmat you have a ranking. Um, so for ID we have points. So the maximum points that you can get is 45, 45 points. How do you get that 45? Just now you have six subjects, right? Each subject, you are graded from one to seven. So seven is the best. Lah. So every time we take picture, you know, we will do like this seven. So, so yeah, seven is the best one that you can get. Lah. So six and seven, 42. Then uh, those another three points is from the core that I explained just now, which is TOK, EE, and CAS. Um, there is like a grading system to it, but that's not really important for this um, level. So basically, you just have to know that six subjects, um, the maximum that you can get for one subject is seven plus with another three points and you get 45. So the goal is to get 45 like if you're an IB student. Okay, next slide. Um, how are you assessed for each subject? Okay, so we have six subjects. Um, for this for one subject, you will have internal and external assessment. So internal assessment for a language subject, for me, I take Malay and English. It will be through oral presentations. So um, <clears throat> there is a, there is a certain system to it lah, but I don't think I need to explain it here. Um, for science, maths, um, I take IT as my. Just now, there was a language and so, uh, there was an individuals and societies group. I take IT and then also um, one more is biology and chemistry. Two more. Okay. So biology, chemistry, IT and maths. Those are not uh, those those subjects. You have I have to do a mini thesis as well as the internal assessment. So. For example, for biology, my mini thesis was to what extent does different packaging affect the freshness of bok choy? So that's one example of a internal assessment for biology. So you have to do that. Like, you have to do the experiment and then you have to write a report. So uh, that's one example. Okay. But other than internal assessment, you will also have external assessment whereby at the end of two years, each subject has two or three papers. So that is what I'm going through now, lah, which is my IB exams. So to summarize, one subject has internal and external assessment. Uh, the internal assessment can either be oral presentation or a mini thesis. And the external assessment uh, is the exams at the end of the two years. Okay, I hope that's clear. If there are questions, you can um, ask me later. Okay, for as for the, uh, not yet. Okay, as for the core components, uh, okay, this is uh, what I said just now, love, which is awarded up to three points, and there is a certain grading system to it, which is kind of hard to understand. So only if you are uh, interested in pursuing the IB, then maybe you can look into it. Okay, next one. Next slide. Estimated cost. So because I'm actually a scholar student under um, MARA YTP program, I the cost for uh, like for me the cost is already much um, incorporated as well along with the my university cost along with um, accommodation along with food so uh, it's a bit hard for me to say about what IB as IB's estimated cost is so I did some research and based on Fairview International School Kuala Lumpur which is one of the schools that provides IB diploma program. 
um, application fee about 1,000, enrollment fee about 5,000, and it's about 30,000 per semester. So keep in mind you have four semesters. So 30,000 times four, 120,000 plus with another 6,000. So it's about 180,000 um, plus minus uh, for the cost. So it's a, a fairly expensive PU program compared to the rest. The okay, next slide. Subjects that you can take for me personally, I take biology, chemistry, maths, analysis and interpretation, which is why it's abbreviated into MEI, Malay, English, and ITGS stands for information technology in a global society. So I don't learn like IT, I learn about how IT affects society. So like um, depend uh, addiction to phones, uh, dependency, reliability, integrity of data and stuff like that. There's also other subjects such as maths analysis and approaches. So this one is more focusing on calculus. You also have business management, economics. Um, the three subjects on the right there is not provided it's not provided by my college, which is psychology, theater, and history. But uh, it is provided in other colleges in Malaysia. So if you are interested to know more, I actually attached the link of where you can see the offered subjects that ID in Malaysia provides. So www.ido.org slash country slash mine. Okay, next slide. As for recognition, as I said just now, IB is started in 1968, which is fairly quite new, um, but it is already accepted into over 100 countries worldwide. So actually, we don't really have to uh, worry about having an unrecognized qualification. So previously, people didn't really understand how hard IB is, uh, not people. Uh, universities didn't really understand how high, hard how hard IB is, so they set like sky high goals. But uh, as for now, more universities are not uh, are more familiar with this program and are making realistic offers to students who choose to take IB. So, from for me, uh, as I said, I want to pursue biochemistry, right? And at the University of Manchester, they of they require me to get thirty six out of forty five which is, um, I hope, achieve, I mean, I think it's achievable. Lah. Okay, next slide. Pros of being an IB student is that it truly makes you become a critical thinker. You, as I said just now, you have to have like, you have to have that one mini thesis, that, the, that EE one, then you also have to have your internet assessment mini thesis. So, and that, internet assessment mini thesis, you have to think of your own research questions and you have to perform research by yourself. And of course, lecturers are there to help you, but um, the basis of it is that you have to think of uh, your whole project yourself. And yeah, it is individual work, not group work. Uh, hone social skills. It requires good communication. This is, um, I, yeah, because IB tends to make you, it's unlike, a level, I think, whereby A level you just study and then you know you can score. But IB, you you require a connection with other people just to you know sometimes just by talking to other friends suddenly you think of a research um, question that you can do for your mini thesis stuff like that. So IB is also a very balanced program. Uh, you have to take, you have to have a subject in each of the group. Um, so yeah, if you're more of a all-rounder, then IB is definitely for you. And lastly, it trains time management because you always have pending work. Because you're doing research, right? It can never be like 100% finished until until like you send it for marking. So other, um, as long as you haven't sent it for marking, you still always have something to like improve on for your mini research. Okay, next slide. Cons, it is not the best if you want the fastest route to degree. Uh, it takes two years, two very long years. And yeah, compared to the rest whereby you can finish pre-U in like 10, 11, 12 months. And it's also not the best pre-U if you tend to be very academic based because you, uh, IB trains you to also um, excel in other skills. It's also not the best if you want to focus on a few subjects only. 
um, because of the six requirement of the six groups that you have to take. Okay, next slide. Is it right for you? Yes, if you're an all-rounder, if you tend to find joy in learning a little bit about everything. Also, if you can multitask, you can, if you can um, handle different, different things at once. Also, if you're up for a challenge, then IB is definitely, definitely, definitely for you. And also, yes, if you can sacrifice sleep. So basically, you need to be, be very passionate about um, bettering yourself, actually. It's not being passionate about your academics, it's about being passionate in bettering yourself and becoming a better human being. Okay, next slide. So this, this is some like proof about how hard IB is, which is, um, if you can see the picture on the left, I actually put a table on my table so that I stand and do work, so that I don't fall asleep. Okay, that is one. And then the one on the right is that actually I had to do, had to work on my research even when I was um, at a vacation. So, you know, it, it requires strong determination. Um, it's definitely not for people who or want to get things done and over with. You definitely need to be determined in doing uh, your research. Okay, next slide. Words of advice, believe in yourself, don't shy away from challenges. Uh, sometimes things can be very intimidating, but I think you should um, definitely take up a challenge because otherwise, how can you like grow, right? You need to grow, you need to go out of your comfort zone, you need to try new things. So um, when choosing a pre -U, I hope you take that into account. As seniors, you're not alone in choosing a pre -U. So um, this, I like this uh, this initiative of TIA whereby you can um, ask a lot of people uh, their their thoughts about their pre -U. Okay, choose for yourself. Don't blindly follow your friends or parents. That's also another important point. Also, um, look ahead. So think about what pre -U will lead you to your desired career. And uh, also. Need to, you need to look at the cost, you need to look at the, is it suitable, is the assessment method suitable for you, etc. Okay, next slide. Uh, that's it for my presentation. I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Dania. Uh, I think we have two questions. The first one, how do you cope with uh, doing mini thesis? It sounds a lot to me, I believe. Oh. That person is talking about you. Okay. Oh, EE. -E. Uh, sorry, EE. -E. Yeah. Yeah. My, we're doing mini thesis. Okay, so I have, um, yeah, there's a lot of mini thesis to be done. Um, that's the thing though, um, because you're so focused on your mini thesis throughout the first three semesters, you don't really get to study. So, uh, okay, how to say? Okay. Um, how, okay, how do I cope with doing mini thesis? You cannot procrastinate, that is one. You cannot, cannot, cannot procrastinate. And then if you're stuck in doing the mini thesis, you have to read up. And if you have too much ideas, then you like, you do a brain dump. You like draw, write down everything that you have in your brain and just dump everything. And then, um, be, and then start from there. Also, teachers will set deadlines. So definitely abide by the deadlines. If you're earlier, that's better so that you can get, you're, you're ahead of other people that, yeah, basically um, read up, do brain dumps, and also abide by the timeline. Those three tips are the main points. Next one would be, do you get to do IB sponsored? Uh, how much do you need to pay in general if sponsored? I think... You're on scholarship, right? Yes, correct. So I'm yes, actually so I'm a scholar student. So how do I get to be IB sponsored? I applied for Mara's White Young Talent Development Program. So I believe TIA has a session about scholarships next week. And I saw one of it is YTP. So probably you can um, explore more next week. How do I get to be IV sponsored? Okay, I applied for YTP. How much do you need to pay in general is sponsored? 
So my my scholarship, my scholarship is actually it's not a scholarship lah. It's a loan that can be changed. So meaning, um, in the future after I finish degree, I may have to pay back. Has to depend on how well I do. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, if you want to do IB and to get sponsored, I think the only body that sponsored IB is uh, Mara. Oh, yeah, and also JPA. Yeah, and JPA. Other than that, is up to the colleges, uh, scholarships and bursary. Yes, and correct. And for information, Danya is also our one of our TIA's tutor. <laughs> Previously, yes really salute her for doing IB because it is one of the most difficult pre-U program in the world. So uh, good luck uh, for your next papers. Okay. All right. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move thank on you. to uh, our ADTP speaker, Alicia. Hi, my name is Alicia and here is a little thing about me is I'm 17 and I'm currently a second sem student at Summer University during the ADTP program and I'm majoring in communication and journalism and um, another thing about me is that I'm an extrovert and I cannot live without my earphones. Um, can I move on to the next slide please? Uh, next. Uh, so the course duration of for the American degree transfer program is about um, the whole program is four years, but um, in some but in some way it is more flexible. So you can do a one to three years at Sunway and two to three years at US or Canada. Um, we can transfer anytime you want. So uh, you can pick like if you want to do two two twinning program or one three or three one It's your choice. Um, can we move on to the next one? Um, so the assessment method in ADTP is 70% um, coursework and 30% um, finals, which is like exam. But um, some subjects like public speaking and computer applications, they're actually 100% coursework based. So there's no finals exam, but you have to do well in your coursework in order to get the A because the threshold is very high. Um, can I move to the next one? Okay, thank you. Um, so the estimated cost in ADTP is about 40000 to 49000 Um, The cost above is estimated for two years in Sunway. Um, it also depends what major you are taking because we actually count the cost by credits. So um, you it may, it may not be this expensive too if you transfer early, but at the same time, it is very expensive because you have to apply it to other universities and mainly they are actually overseas. So. Um, universities overseas are actually more expensive here. So this is the estimated cost. Um, mostly we pay by semester. If you decided to transfer in like two semester, you just have to pay two semester cost, which is about like 19,000. Um, yeah, it's very flexible. And here are the scholarships. Um, sorry, can you, um, here are the scholarships. Um, in Sunway, there, for the ATP, there's like two scholarship, one I think uh, for the first one, I think it's called the Jeffrey Chess Scholarship, and the second one is a Special Merit Award, and you can redeem the scholarship according to your result of SPM or IGCSE. And um, if you get nine and above of A's, um, you can get like a full scholarship for like a year because thirty credit hour is a year. Um, program, um, most country accept because you're actually going but not as an ADTP student, but you're going as a transfer student. So it's like doing a degree in Malaysia and transferring to overseas. So here are some countries that you can transfer to uh, with ADTP. But basically, you can transfer to any country as long as they accept transfer student. Some examples are USA, Canada, France, and UK. But in UK, some universities like Cambridge and Oxford, they do not accept transfer. So if you want to go there, I highly recommend you to actually not consider ADTP, but instead consider courses like A-levels. And China, Australia, or you can travel back locally in Malaysia. Um, in Sunway, you can also do um, two years in ADTP and then two years in Sunway uh, uh, School of Arts or whatsoever, because um, ADTP is like not a foundation program. And Italy and Germany, countries like that. Um, so here are the pros. Um, ADTP is highly recommended for people who wanted to go to USA and Canada. 
And it is a great program um, because um, you're actually saving time and money if you want to go to that country. And at the same time, you also get to um, explore and study in the country and graduate there. And you can also apply to all universities in USA and Canada because um, in US and Canada, all universities accept transfer students. So there are more than 2,000 universities in USA and more universities all around the world. And you can also apply to countries like Europe, Asia, um, or you, Australia because they all accept transfer students. You just have to check with the university you wanted to go to. And the third pros is that you get to skip pre-U. So um, you, when taking ADTP, you, you, you jump straight right into degree. You do not need to do any um, foundation or any like, you know, pre-U program. So you basically, you're basically doing degree and after four years, you will be graduating. And we are following the American system in education. So you get to change every subject new semester. Like for the first semester, you may take subjects like mathematics, science, computer, and public speaking. And the second semester, you get to pick like um, Malaysian history, American history, um, film. So it's not related, but at the same time, um, <clears throat> you have to make sure your major, um, the, the, the university you want to go to, accept this subject as a transfer credit. Um, okay, here are the cons. Um, so ADTP is actually quite challenging for people who do not like project because I think it's more on like a 90% project-based course and 10% like assessment course. So I think every time you go to class, people will just give you a, a assignments and projects. And <clears throat> it um, it is actually best if you can, talk, can think about your major clearly, because um, once you get in, like for example, first time you get in, you wanted to do business as your major. And second time you think, oh, you want to change to, um, for example, um, computer science, for example. So you you still can change but once you change the computer science it is actually very hard for you to change back because in a third sem you have to actually kind of confirm so if you regret taking computer science in a second sem and you want to go to your third sem and you want to change back to business it is very hard for you because um they actually uh, do not allow you to do that as the transfer credit might actually be a problem right there and third the grid threshold are very high so about 90 and above is an A, um, 75 to 89 is a B, but I think currently right now is 80 to 89 a B. And then um, 70 to 79 is a C, but uh, the threshold actually changes almost every semester, but this is the, this is the previous semester. And anything below a 65% basically is a D or known as fail. So if you fail the subject, basically you get 65 and below, you have to retake it or you are not allowed to transfer your credit to the other universities. So ADTP is more suitable for students who are dreaming of going to the US or Canada and a student who love project and assignments, you love to work on projects and you briefly know what you want to major in. So you confirm and you know what you want to do in and like what road you want to go and it's, also um, suitable for people who love trying new things and activities every semester because you get to change every semester. So it is good because you get you get to experience different things as you're interested in. Um, okay, here's some honest advice from me. Um, after like uh, two to three sums in ADTP, time planning is very important because um, the amount of assignments is actually pile up and you don't want to pile up your assignments because um, the lecturers will be giving you almost like two assignments a week. And with the project time given, it is very important because you don't want to do it last minute or you will actually fail. And second is socialize around. Um, mixed, um, most students are friendly, so just talk to them and make new friends, but you just have to be a little careful. Yeah. And third advice is pick the right group partner because um, if your friend cannot work or like just because you want to group up with them because you're like they're your best friend but they can't work like just don't don't join them because your grades are very important and the fourth advice is be active in class um adtp classes are like very interactive the lecturers will call you and stand up you know just talk so um just be active just uh 
talk, talk to everyone and answer questions given by your lecturers because you, this will give them a good impression about you and you will actually have a better recommendation letter written to you while you're about to transfer. Okay, move on to the next one. Okay, here are some useful links I gave. Um, you guys can check it out. Uh, and it, these are all related to ADTP. And I think, yeah, that's it. I'm opening the floor to questions. Okay, thank you. So the first question we have here is, do you have to learn French for this program? Uh, and what's training program slash joint program? Uh, you do not need to learn French because this is an American program. But if you are planning to transfer to France, it is recommended for you to learn French recommended for as an additional language. And training program is like two years in Malaysia and two years overseas, the country of your choice. So it's like two, two. And joint program is almost the same thing. So training is basically an e like even amount. Like I'm also doing training in ADTP right now. So I'll be doing two years in Sunway and two years in overseas. This I think is the US will be two years. So I'll be graduating from the US and not Malaysia. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Mm, we don't have any more questions here. Uh, it's fine. So if you have any other questions, you can uh, just ask and we will have our final round of uh, Q&A sessions at the end of this workshop. Next up, uh, we will move to the accounting side. So first one, we have uh, Nabil, who will be presenting about ACCA. Yeah, Nabil. Okay, thank you, Farhan. Hi, everyone. I'm Na Hi, and Assalamualaikum, everyone. I'm Nabil. I'm doing. I'm a final year student doing ACCA in Sunway College. So today I'll be speaking about ACCA, which is uh, stands for Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. So today I'll be speaking uh, in a point of view of a person who don't know ACCA in general, as if I'm a I'm, I'm in my first year doing ACCA. So proceed to the next slide. Okay, so today I'll, I'll introduce about the brief introduction of ACCA, FIA, and ACCA. Okay, actually, there's a difference between ACCA, FIA, and ACCA. Even though ACCA, FIA is a sub department under ACCA, ACCA, FIA is like a pre university program for ACCA. So, ACCA is, is a whole, is a whole, uh, another course different from ACCA, FIA, which stands for Foundation in Accountancy. So, if you do, if you look at your right side of the diagram, starting from the bottom up if you did spm right now and you want to proceed to acca you will have to do acca fia first which is the blue color box uh, which consists of consists of seven papers uh, pro approximately you will do the paper around one year one uh, three paper in six months uh, sorry three paper in three months and then you only can proceed to acca if you provide you pass all the papers and in general, all ACCA and ACCA FIA papers requires you to pass have a uh, pass the passing mark of fifty marks, and in order to get the passing mark, you have to uh, do questions consistently and do passive questions lah. So if you look at the left side of the diagram, after you completed your FIA, you will proceed to ACCA, which uh, consists of three three levels. But in this, in the right, in the left side of the diagram, is on, it's only two levels, which is the red box, ACCA applied skills. And you go up a bit, it's ACCA strategic professional level. So what is ACCA actually when your auntie or relatives ask you? ACCA is not a degree or master's degree, but it's rather a professional qualifications. So when you pass your FIA, Foundations Accountancy, you go up to your applied skills, ACCA, which is equivalent to your degree, the uh, bachelor's degree. And even though it's not a degree program, but you can opt to do a uh, degree because ACCA has a collaboration with OBU, Oxford Brooks University. You just have to submit your thesis paper and then you can obtain the uh, degree of qualification. After you uh, completed your applied skill levels, which consists of six papers there, you can move up to the final strategic professional level, which consists of four, four papers. This uh, level is equivalent to a master's degree and ACC ha has a collaboration with Un University of London and you can opt to do your separate uh, master's degree qualification there. After that, 
uh, after you completed your ACCA papers, you have to work for three years in order for you to obtain your professional experience and becoming a chartered accountant uh, under ACCA and also chartered accountants in your respective uh, country that you will practice. For example, in Malaysia, we have MIA, Malaysian Institute of Accountants, which uh, after you obtain your chartered accountants, you will be provided with a title and a license in order for you to sign the required documents like, and you have a CA title uh, uh, behind your name in every professional documents that you take. So moving on uh, to the right side of the diagram, this is the three uh, levels that I mentioned in ACCA, which is the applied knowledge in the grey box, applied skills and strategic professional. In total, ACCA have uh, 13 papers, but if you uh, if you manage to obtain uh, pass your FIA foundation accountancy, you will have you will be exempted from applied knowledge uh, level, which is you you will just do ten papers only instead of thirteen. For me personally, uh, uh, I'm doing I, I I did my FIA in twenty twenty one, and uh, I have been exempted from the applied knowledge. And this is my eleven out of thirteen paper. I have two papers remaining. Uh, for me, I'm in my the blue box. The strategic professional level. I'm doing SPR right now, which is stands for strategic business reporting. So moving on to the next slide. Okay, uh, what is a seven year rule? Okay, uh, obtain, doing ACCA is completely on your own. You don't have a specific time frame for you to complete or finish it. You can do, for example, halfway, and you can decide to just work. Uh, while uh, while working, you can do part time ACCA, part time learning ACCA. But however, ACCA has a seven year rule which uh, applies to only strategic professional level papers. For example, how to illustrate this. Whenever you pass your applied knowledge skills level, which is the second level on the right diagram just now, uh, you will proceed to the professional level papers. After you've done your first uh, professional level papers, you have seven years to complete your whole ACC agency, meaning you pass your first paper in a strategic professional. The, the other three papers you have uh, seven years remaining to complete it. So, for, for example, if you are working, you did your first uh, professional level papers. You have seven years to complete it. So you have to complete it within that time time period, lah, Or else you'll be excluded from ACC registry. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Okay, for FIA Foundation in Accountancy. If you are an SPM uh, uh, student, you have to obtain a minimum of 5C, including mathematics and English. And there is no requirement to study principal Reconnaissance in SPM because I'm saying this because uh, ACCA FIA will teach you again from the beginning, from, from zero, uh, about principal Reconnaissance. However, if you study principal Reconnaissance in SPM before and you obtain a minimum, minimum of A- minus in it, you will, will be exempted from one paper in ACC FIA, which is a uh, FIA one paper for recording financial transaction paper. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Okay, this is an estimated cost of doing FIA. Uh, bear in mind that this is uh, a cost of studying in a private institution. And if you study in private institution or any institution in general, ACC often categorize uh, their learning institution into three categories. Uh, it's like a recognition criteria uh, for the learning institution. There is a silver, um, sorry, there's a silver, gold, and platinum category. Platinum, for example, if you are, uh, if that institution is a platinum learning provider, recognized by ACCA, that learning provider is, uh, in general, is a quality, provide quality education. And how to obtain the, how to maintain the platinum status, that institution must. Um, have a passing rate of their students more than the the average global passing rate, meaning that if the students in the in the, that particular university, let's say Sunway University or Sawai Test in general, uh, have a fifty student, that fifty students must all pass uh, above their above the world passing rate. So this is the total cost of doing FIA, which is totaling around two twenty thousand dollars, and there is two fees payable. One is uh, to your private institution, to your learning institution, and the other is to ACCA. So for foundation, uh, learning institution often requires around fifteen thousand dollars, fifteen thousand ringgit, including your MPU subjects. However, this is not included the accommodation fees and your pocket money lah. And the other the other fees payable is external fees, uh, which is payable to ACCA because ACCA is a UK organization, so the 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 currency is. Great Britain pound, eighty nine dollar, eighty nine pound for registration fee on one day, or you obtain a scholarship from the uh, from a particular university. Move, uh, moving on to the next slide. 
the estimated cost of doing uh, ACCA, uh, back one slide, sorry. The 20,000 uh, total cost is from FIA. However, for ACCA, it's uh, $45,000. I can move on to back slide, previous slide. Okay, this, this is it. Thank you. Uh, for ACC, it's 45,000 ringgit in total. If, uh, the two fees payable is one for your private institution is 30,000 ringgit. The other one is um, uh, to ACC, this, this fee is quite the same for FIA, the initial registration fee and subscription fee. However, the exam fee increased a bit of 132 to vary from 132 to 240 of pounds per paper. And might bear in mind that this this is a huge cost, and it might differ significantly if you study in public or you obtain a scholarship. Next slide. Okay, people often ask what is a career path of uh, a chartered accountant. In general, chartered accountant usually work in business, any business that you can think of. Uh, and if specifically, there are few uh, three industries that uh, chartered accountant works on. The first one being public practice. This is uh, some accounting firms that uh, some of you may have heard of, which is the big four, PwC, EY, uh, Deloitte, and KPMG. These firms often uh, uh, provide professional, uh, professional services, which is uh, auditing, taxation, and advisory services to their clients. The other industry is corporate accounting, which is any other commercial companies. Next slide. Doing ACCA is actually quite similar with the next uh, presenter, Lin Jia. She will be present, presenting about ICAW. So ICAW is also a professional qualification quite similar with ACCA. The aim is to produce chartered accountants. So the pros of doing this qualification is the first, you will have a career passport. You can work in 179, 79 countries recognized by ACCA. That means, uh, remember that I said that ACCA is not a degree, however, it's a professional qualification. From this qualification alone, you can work in these 179 countries that is recognized by ACCA. Lah. For example, in UK, Singapore, you want to work in big four in Singapore also can. Then the next one is fast track to corporate life. Uh, your study period starting from your foundation, from your pre-university to uh, completing ACCA is just 3.5 years provided that you straight pass your paper, mean, means that uh, you pass more than 50, you obtain more than 50 percent of your marks in each paper so for me personally i did i started my fia in uh, during uh, when i was 18 years old and right now i'm 21 uh inshallah i'll be completing cca this year and starting to work this year at the age of 21. however just take your time no uh, everyone has a different goal in life so no need to rush some uh, some people for me uh, maybe my goals is to work faster, so this is uh, a qualification for me. And the next one is you can become a young chartered accountant with just three years experience, then you can obtain your license already, or the, the one I, I talk about, chartered accountant title, the CA title from ACC and MIA. Um, next one is this qualification is highly, highly rewarded because many business, uh, many companies recognize it and your pay is based on your experience and skills. So moving on to the on slide. Okay, doing ECCA means that your mental health is at a risk to be honest because ECCA have a very low passing rate, average of 40 to 50 percent per paper. To illustrate this, uh, imagine if 100 percent enters the exam hall, only 40 of them uh, goes out and pass the paper. So that uh, talks about how hard the paper is. And the next one is fast paced study period. So after you complete a new paper, a paper in, let's say you complete the paper in three months or six months, you just jump to a new paper in the next semester. So the breaks is usually just one to two weeks. So your mind is very, very um, uh, saturated and it gives like no, no breaks in between. Lah. So you have to manage your free time and your study time very, very well. And the last one is, uh, which is uh, the stereotype of ACC, like it is very stressful, it's very hard, which is, I would personally say it's true, but we have to manage it uh, personally, like uh, have a, enjoy your time with friends also and uh, focus on your study, but you have to balance it. Uh, next slide. This is the example of my timetable. Right now I'm doing SBR, Strategic Business Reporting, the professional level paper. So my timetable is super packed. 
uh, I have 6.5 hours a day classes, but this uh, this type of uh, timetable is only for my subject, SPR. The all other ACC subjects, the average uh, hours they, they have classes a day is only four hours per day. So only um, exception to SPR, my subject, because this subject have the most uh, packed syllabus. Uh, so I have 6.5 hours class a day. And usually I have a three month semester and uh, I have, uh, after the three months, I have like one or two two weeks breaks. This, the, the maximum break I get is three, three weeks. Lah. Then I proceed to the next paper. So next slide. So how do you know if ACC is, a, is the right thing for you? If you, can, if you want to penetrate into business and corporate world, for me, the reason why I did ACC in the first place is I want to work in the corporate industry. Uh, I want to work in business and maybe move up the ladder into leadership role. And next is if you have strong analytical skills, you can analyze the numbers and math. However, as you say, it's not only limited to math, mathematics, it's also uh, your analytical skills, your storytelling skills also. Then uh, if you have good comprehension skills, you can explain things well, it's, as you say, it's the right thing for you. And of course, this applies to everyone. If you have curiosity and willingness to learn, you can do everything in life. So next slide. Words of advice of doing ACCA. If you did SPM and you didn't take principal accountant, don't worry because everyone has equal chance of passing ACCA. I have a lot of friends who didn't do principal accountant, but they passes ACCA as well. And next is I always have a questioning mind in order to have a deep understanding this applies to everyone lah, when you learn a topic you must learn it very very deeply in order for you to explain it in the in the exam because ACC, ACC is an exam based paper so you don't have any assignments or you don't have any uh, um, groups group project that you do with your friends so it's a 100 percent your marks will be based on exams so that one is a bit lacking in terms of communication skills so you have to uh, find your own ways of improving your communication skills such as joining clubs or societies or maybe it is in action, who knows? And the next one is you never study last minute. Lah. Uh, this is for me also, because if you procrastinate in life, everything will be hard for you and you will get mental health problems later. The next one is study smart because efforts beats intelligence. I have a uh, very, very, a lot of friends who didn't score well in their SPM, didn't even take principal accountant, but they, they did well in the CCA because they study smart. Uh, I have a very disciplined, uh, studying like do past year every day they have a study plan do three four questions a day for example lah. so next slide I think that's it yep anyone have a question okay, okay. we do have questions Abel. Uh, the first one okay the first one i heard that acca is very challenging how do you cope with it in terms of time management and looking for useful resources Okay, that's a that is a very good question. That is my thought also when I first enter ACCA. To answer your question, yes, it is true that ACCA is very very challenging. However, it is manageable for me. If you, I'm the real real example of it. I did, I'm not a smart person, but uh, however, uh, uh, I'm in my final year already. How do I cope with it? Is uh, you have to have you you need to have a balance between your study time, and your leisure time. If you like, for example, if you have a full day class, your end, your class ends at 4 p.m. You can have a break for a while. You can have a nap and then you must straight, straight away study. Do, do pass your question, do question, revise back what you uh, learned. Because if you didn't do that, you will struggle in the in the next few weeks. But there's always last minute study. Uh, I also a uh, last minute person. However, like I said before, your mental health will be at risk. Lah. Uh, if you last minute study, anxiety will kick in. You cannot sleep at night. So the best advice is if uh, that I can give to a person who want to study is study early, never do last minute, and it is minute and really really manageable. You can do it. Manageable. You can do it. And to look for sorry, sorry, one more, to look for useful resources, uh, you can always go to ACC official website. There's a lot of technical articles, past year questions, past and related related questions. Uh, so you can just browse through the website, or even just Google any past year question you can find in uh, Google. Okay, the next question. Good luck, Bang. Just hearing about ACCA already got me crying. What's your biggest motivation? Okay, Abang Nabil. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to whoever said this. Uh, good luck to you too. 
Um, actually, ACC, yes, it's true. It's, it, it makes me cry. Sometimes I didn't cry publicly, but in the toilet. Uh, my biggest motivation is working life because I want to work early and earn money and support and uh, just checklist all my goals in life. That's my biggest motivation. Okay, uh, last one. Is there any chance to do ACC overseas? Uh, that's a very good question. Yes, it is absolutely every chance to do ACC overseas. You can, after you study, you can just go to Singapore and work. It, it is that easy. And uh, for example, employer's perspective, uh, it doesn't matter if you did your ACC in Malaysia or Singapore or in UK because all the syllabus are same. You are, will be taking the same paper as a person who will be taking it in UK. So uh, results-wise, your results will be the same. So in an employer's perspective, uh, it will be equal in to other to other candidates, lah, other ACCA candidates. Okay. Thank you, Nabil. I think that's all from now. So thank you very much for the sharing about ACCA. Now we move on to another professional accounting program, ICAEW. So we will have Lin Xiang to share about her program. I'm an ICAW ACA student. I am some of y'all will be interested in that scholarship. And so I would be uh, talking about it later in my presentation. Right, so um, I was also an audit intern at KPMG Malaysia. Uh, am I lagging? Or is it all good? Okay, so I'll continue. Right, so um, yeah, I interned at KPMG Malaysia last December as an audit intern. and. In terms of you know other co curriculum comp competitions, I did, I did um, the Deloitte Tax Challenge last year, and I was also the president of the Summary Big Talk Club, and also I joined a few other competitions as well. Right. So next slide. <clears throat> yeah. So I'm here today to talk about that none other than the ICAW program, which is otherwise known as the Institute of Chartered Accountant in England and Wales. So. Um, I would say that not a lot of you have heard, have uh, know about ICW, and yeah, I would say a good percentage of you guys have not even heard of ICW prior to coming to our workshop today. But yeah, it's okay. I'm here for a reason. So let's jump into the brief introduction to ICW. Okay, so um, as you may or may not know, like ACCA, ICW is also a Chartered Accountancy Program. So when people hear the name, you know, Chartered Accountancy Program, they have a common misconception, misconception that you have to be an accountant um, after you study the course. But is that true? Um, no. So why should you consider ICAW? I would say try to picture yourself in five to ten years. Right. So if working in the corporate world and leading a team in a corporate setting is where you see yourself, I see you should definitely consider this program because I feel that it really gives you that extra lift in the early stages of your career that many of your peers either don't get or take a longer time to reach that point. Right. So next slide. So according to research, um, around 83% of the FTSE 100 company boards include at least one ICW member. So what's FTSE 100, right? Um, it's actually the top 100 companies that are listed on the London Stock Exchange. So, you know, the company boards, do you know who sits on the company boards? Company boards include people like the CEO, CFO, directors of, you know, all departments like finance director, marketing director, and such and such. Right. We're talking about company boards and they include at least one ICW member. Um, I'm not even talking about regular employees yet. And so this backs up my point that ICW prepares you for the corporate world instead of just accounting. Right, so next slide. So about the outline of the course, if you're doing, if you're starting from um, an SPM graduate, you would first do CFAP, which is Certificate in Finance, Accounting and Business, and then you would move on to the professional level and to the advanced level, right? So it's 100% exam based. Um, yeah, so if you pass, you pass. If you fail, you fail, right? You don't get any assignments or coursework to, you know, help you in that sort of way. 
Right, so there are 15 modules in total. And if you go to the next slide, you could see that uh, I labeled the duration of the courses at, of the course as well. Um, so for the certificate level, it's sort of like a foundation, if you understand it in that way. It's sort of like a foundation for you, right? You take 1.5 years and then professional level would be one year and then your training contract would take three years. So in total, you would take 5.5 years in order to qualify as a chartered account, as an ICW chartered accountant. Right, so um, speaking about the outline of the course, I would one thing I would like to highlight is um, how ICW values practical experience over just theory. Like, as you can see, um, after your uh, CFAP, you would have to do a three-month internship. And then for your advanced level, you would be doing a training contract. Um, training contract is sort of like, no, okay. So what is a training contract? It means that you have to do the last three papers while working. So it is, yeah, it's set by ICAW. Like you cannot say, oh, can I do, can I be a full-time student and complete the last three papers first before I start working? No, you have to do it while you're working. So, yeah, so I really feel that this is one of, one of the points that attracted me to ICAW lab, is that it really highlights the, you know, hands-on experience instead of just, just working, instead of just like studying, right? So, yeah, and then, and you might want to take a screenshot of this slide, but I just want to say in terms of duration, this course is really, is a fast course, lah, right? You get qualified in 5.5 years, and then you start working in just merely 2.5 years. Right, so next slide. Um, yeah, so this is the minimal entry requirements, and this is where it gets a bit cruel. Um, you need to have a minimum of five A's in SPM, which includes A minus, A and A plus. Um, and includes mathematics and English as well in order to be able to get into this course. Yeah, and so if you, your SPM results aren't out yet, right? Yeah, so if you think you cannot achieve it, then yeah, it's just forget about what I just said earlier. And yeah, and if you're joining from degree or A-levels, um, you have a different entry requirement that you have to um, comply to. And yeah, if you're joining from degree or A levels, you can try to talk to the administration office and can you can like apply for something called CPL. CPL is actually uh, called the pre credit for prior learning, which means that you get some of the papers exempted. Right. So um, next slide. So there are only two places in Malaysia where you can do ICW. Um, one of them is, of course, the one and only Sunway College, uh, more specifically Sunway Test, and the other one is Intech College. But Intech College is only open for Bumi Putra students, so my presentation today will only be based on Sunway College. Huh? Right, so next slide. So about the estimated costs and scholarships available. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, this is the cost that yeah okay so a disclaimer first uh, so this uh this cost that i got is based on when i enrolled into the course um yeah so i don't know if they adjusted it a bit or not for inflation or whatever but it should be around the same uh. yeah so as you can see um with the scholarship right if you have the scholarship um you have to get above nine a's and above right so, and you would get your CFAP sponsored and your professional level sponsored. So in total, you just have to pay 6,000 ringgit. But if you get eight A's, you would be sponsored for your CFAP only and professional level is actually self-payment. And if you don't have any sponsorship, um, you would have to fork up a total of 73K. Yeah, um, and you might or might not have realized that your advanced level is all sponsored by someone called ATE. So what is an ATE? Um, if you guys have, if you guys are interested to know about it, um, yeah, you can ask me in Q and A. But yeah, so I just want to say I don't know if you guys have done your research on scholarships yet or not. But when when I just done my when I just done my SPM, right, I actually looked through the scholarships and then usually uh, 
um, you would need to have a minimum of 9A plus in order to get a full scholarship. And then the full scholarship is usually just for your foundation level. So I really feel that this is a great deal because you only need 9As to get the scholarship and it is covered from foundation all the way to, you know, to when you are qualified. So yeah. Um, right, okay, so I would like to add on a bit. Um, you might want to ask if I get like, if I only have five or six A's, is it still possible for me to secure a full scholarship? Yes, it is possible. And it is for ICW only. If you guys are interested to know more about that part, just, you know, yeah, ask me in Q&A. Right, so next, next slide. So we have the subjects that we have. Um, us students like to call it core subjects and internal subjects, right? Core subjects are basically the subjects that are that determine whether you qualify as a chartered accountant or not. And these are the papers that are set by ICW in UK, right? And the internal subjects are, okay, like, it's not that nice to put it in that way, but to be honest, it's not that important, right? Anyways, so next slide, please. So these are the subjects that you would be doing, right? So for CFAP, there are six modules then professional also six modules and then advanced level you have three more modules left so in total you would have 15 papers to pass yeah so you might see oh you like you might ask lah, right now uh, why accountants need to study law as well so i would i would say that you know if you are you if you are an, if you are a practicing accountant and you don't know about the law it's like getting to drive but you don't know about the traffic rules right so yeah you get to study a lot of different um, subjects as well, as you can see, right? You have tax as well, financial management and stuff, right? So next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so internal subjects. So for internal subjects, the highlighted in yellow ones are MPU subjects. MPU subjects are basically the subjects that uh, the Malaysian education system wants you to learn, then the ones that are not highlighted are the ones that uh, Sunway has uh, wants us to learn, right? So yeah, these are, I would say they are, like, they are lighter and yeah, they are lighter subjects and it's more based on coursework. Yep. Okay, next slide, please. Right, so what are your career paths as an ICW Chartered Accountant? Um, okay, next slide. Yep, so uh, you would, so I would say that the most popular industry is actually the audit industry instead of the accounting industry. Like a lot of my, my seniors, peers, they, they want, they, yeah, a lot of them plan to go into the audit industry after they graduate like, instead of the accounting industry. So I really don't know where, the, where did that misconception come about, but yeah. So other than audit industry, you would have your advisory or consultancy industry and also business, corporate finance, you can go into insolvency, tax, forensic accounting. Yeah, just in case you're wondering, forensic accounting is not, it's not the same as your usual accounting, right? Uh, if you're interested to know more about it, you can also ask me in Q&A. Um, and so moving on, you have your public sector. If you want to work for the government as well, you can do, you can do so. Right, um, as, as you may or may not know, uh, Dr. Rafizi Ramli, um, he's our current Minister of Economic Affairs, right, he's also a chartered accountant, he's also an ICAW chartered accountant. Right, so next slide. So what are the pros of this course? Um, one of the pros is that it is a prestigious course. Okay, so... Um, yeah, I can kind of foresee during Q&A, somebody will ask me to explain the differences between ACCA and ICAW. Um, okay, so it's okay. I will, ex I will explain right now. Lah, okay, so one of the differences is that um, ICA ICAW only allows you to have four tries per paper, while ACCA has unlimited tries. Means you can fail a, pa you can fail a paper for four times and then yeah, you will be out of the course regardless of how many papers you have completed prior to that failed paper. Yeah, and another point is that ICW has only 
Okay, ICW has a passing mark of 55 marks, while ACCA has a passing mark of 50 marks. And yeah, and so that's what makes it more stringent and rigorous, I, I would say, right? And then next is that ICW is also a globally recognized program. And yeah, it may not be quite patriotic for me to say this, but if you plan to work in Singapore after you've completed your program, um, if you are an ICW, you get to you get to go to Singapore and then work straight away. Lah. But if you're ACCA, as, as far as I know, you have to complete some sort of an exam, right? That's like to adapt you to the, I don't know, the regulation environment of uh, Singapore, something like that. Lah. Yeah. So next point is that um, it is a fast course. Right, you literally start gaining work experience in just merely 2.5 years. So I just take myself as an example, right? I'm 20 this year, and then you know, I would be completing my professional level this year, December. And so at the age of 21, I would be working already. Yeah, while some of my peers they just they just they've just completed their foundation and they are just starting their degree life. Yeah, and then you get to be a chartered accountant in just 5.5 years. And also moving on, it's um it's a high pay, um, I would say professional, right? So you know, just speaking about audit, you get a starting pay of four four thousand per month, and then you know, as someone from the industry, I can tell you that it is very likely you would be able to hit ten k per month, um, at before the age of twenty five, I would say, and this is just the audit industry. You know, you you still have other industries that are more high paid than this. And I'm not even talking about working in Singapore yet, right? So yeah. So next we have um, yeah practice over theory, like what I mentioned just now, right? So at yeah, I I was 19 last year and I already got the chance to go for an internship, um, and yeah, and my peers they are mo they are mostly still like foundation students, while we already get to have a chance to get a glimpse of the real working world already. Yeah, and also the three months training contract, they, yeah, it literally, I feel like it literally allows you to graduate with three years of work experience. Yeah, which is something that is special about this program. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so next thing I would be talking about is the cons of the program. I would, I would say it is quite risky, uh, right? In in the yeah, I would say it was it, it was a risky it is a risky program, and many of my friends I would say they they when they sign into that when they sign in for the for the course they don't I feel they don't even know that they consented to this risk. So yeah, you for like like what I mentioned just a lot. You have four tries per module, and if you fail, you literally fall back on nothing, right? So um. Yeah, story time lah. Okay, one ICW senior, he he passed fourteen out of fifteen papers in ICW, but there was one professional level paper that he just couldn't pass, and he was on his fourth fail already. So supposedly he should be out of the program lah, right? But then the firm that he was working with at that time, they actually helped him to you know Marayu to ICW in England, and then like oh okay, so they gave him a fifth try lah. So he set for it and then at last he passed, right? But it is, I, yeah, you can just try to imagine like, it was the stress on his shoulders when he was sitting the last paper, the last try, when he was having his last try, right? If he fails that paper, then all of his hard work, like for three, three to four years, is all gone, right? And he's just like a what? SPM graduate only. So yeah, I would say you, can, you should consider the risk and whether you are willing to take it up or not. Right. And then the next point is no college life. Um, I personally don't really agree with it. So you can see like the two question marks beside it. So a lot of people say that, uh, you know, you're technically only a full time student for 2.5 years. Right. After that, you would have to work already and then you don't get to experience college life that much. Um, to be honest, I would say that it actually depends more on the individual and your willingness to step out of your comfort zone right because i have yeah i have friends who are in degree they yeah they have plenty of time 
but they don't join any anything else. They don't even come to physical class. They chose online instead. And yeah. And like, if you look at me, my course is so short, but I still managed to participate in so many clubs, competitions and stuff. So I really feel it's unfair to blame it completely on the course. Lah. It depends on the individual's willingness, I would say. Right, so, and it is a stressful program, like Nabil mentioned just now, right? We have packed time schedules. Like it is not, it is not uncommon for us to have classes that start from eight to four. And then we have like what a one hour break in between. Yeah, and then we also have frequent tests as well. So um, I will let you guys have a glimpse of my time schedule. You can like go to the next slide. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's eight to four almost every single day. And then, yeah, it, okay, if you want to compare it to your like secondary school life, you might say, oh, I, I, I used to wake up at 7.30 and then I have like what co-curriculum until 5.30 or so. But if you compare it to other courses like your MAFI, CIMP, right, you would, yeah, you would find it was it's really packed, lah, right? And yeah, and then towards the end of the semester, you can go to the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, yeah, it becomes more packed. Yeah, because you're nearing finals already. And so, yeah, I would say it is quite stressful. And then you see the gray boxes. The gray boxes are actually um, exams uh, that we have. Yeah, so, okay. So next slide, please. Right, so how do you know if ICW is right for you? So like what I mentioned just now, um, if you're okay with the corporate life, because uh, I would say at least in the first few years of your career, you you have like a great 90% chance of landing in a corporate job. And you know, if the thought of working in corporate is just insufferable to you, like a nine to five job is just insufferable, you know, office politics is just makes you sick, you know, that you can, you just cannot do corporate, lah, then I feel that you shouldn't consider it, right? And then, yeah, the next point is you shouldn't hate accounting, I feel. Because, yeah, it might I might sound a bit contradicting to my point just now. Yeah, you not necessarily have to be an accountant. But um, if you hate accounting, I feel your life would be, you would be suffering uh, doing ICW because it's sort of like the base for all the other papers. Yeah, you have to have basic accounting knowledge to do the other papers as well, not just the accounting papers. Right, and it is also more suitable for those who are self-motivated because, yeah, like I said, um, it's exam-based and then even though your lectures are good, they can only help you to that point and it depends on yourself also. Uh. Yeah, and then you have to be a fast learner as well because, um, say, for example, professional level, you have to complete six modules in just one year. So you know, average speaking, you have to complete, you have to learn up a whole new subject in just two months, right? So yeah, it helps out if you're a fast learner and also you have to have a good, yeah, it's advisable if you have a good command of English, right? Because uh, the whole program is completely in English and then the some of the English they use, right, is like fancy English, right? Because it's, yeah, the course is from UK, right? Yeah, as the name suggests, uh, the course is from UK. And then, yeah, sometimes the English that they use is like quite fancy English. And then, you know, it just, it might confuse you a bit like, if you're not that good at English. But yeah, um, so yeah, but it's not necessary for you to have all these criteria to be able to join ICW. Uh. You can still, you know, even if you're like, for example, uh, your English is not good, or maybe you learn a bit slower, you can still join, but you know, you would, need more effort, I would say. Okay, next page, please. Right, so words of, words of advice is, um, although the course is, I would say, it's a, it's a nice course, I would say, but it is not everyone's cup of tea, and I understand that, right? Because somebody don't like, like, a short learning, how do you say, like, like they don't want to graduate that fast and start working at that young of an age, right? And so, yeah, you might want to consider degree. After degree, you might want to do, you know, yeah, further your education in professional programs like these. Uh. And then secondly is you must be ready to put in your effort um, before joining the course, uh, right? You don't just, like, you don't just join and then like, oh, you know, just try that, uh, right? 
then you fail for four times and then you get kicked out of the course and then you just waste your time studying there right and then yeah and then you have to do foundation all over again in another course yeah and then the third point is that um yeah when you first join icaw when you first join cfab la, you would there is a possibility that you feel dumb in your among your classmates because like i mentioned although the minimal entry requirement is just five days but to be really honest with you la, um your classmates you would have like average speaking everybody would be like seven a's seven or eight a's yeah so it's really easy to you know you know you feel dumb among your classmates and yeah you like you feel demotivated la, throughout what so yeah be humble so i think that's all from me yeah and i i also like um compiled some uh frequently asked questions if you guys have yeah, you guys can like glance through these questions and if you guys want me to cover any of those, I can do it. But if you guys have any questions that you have on your mind, you can ask me and I will try my best to answer them. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the Q&A. Okay, we have one here. Is it compulsory to take accounting for SPM in order for me to study ICAEW? Um, no. Um, I have a lot of friends who are from pure science stream. Yeah, it might be shocking to you. I, I don't know. It might be shocking to you. Lah. But I have a lot of friends who are in pure science stream and then they are doing ICAW and they are, yeah, they are doing better than ever. I feel it's more on your own potential, right? Because some people, I don't know if you, have, you guys have those kind of classmates before, like they don't really have to study a lot and then they can just go into the exam and then, you know, just excel in it. So yeah, it depends more on your willingness to learn and also the potential that lies within you, I would say. Okay, so uh, I don't think there's more Q&A question uh, in the slides and also comment sections. Uh, if we do have any, we will continue with uh, later on. Uh, we will proceed with our last uh, speaker. Uh, Mungti, who will be presenting about STPM. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you to Farhan and thank you to TIA for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So my name is Mungti. I'm 20 years old this year and I just graduated from STPM just a month ago. So next. So about STPM, uh, it is actually the default um, you course that you will go to after SPM uh, before all these A levels and other pre courses. Uh, so you don't have to register yourself. Uh, you don't have to enroll in it as long as you pass the minimum requirement, which includes passing Sajara, passing your PM, and some other requirements. You're automatically offered uh, a position to study STPM in uh, a SMK or a college that the government will assign you to. Next, please. So STPM is actually uh, quite a time consuming pre u course compared to the rest. Uh, from some sources will tell you it's around one and a half years, but that is only the duration of your studies. Uh, if you would take into account the whole duration of from the day that you graduate from SPM to the day that you enter uni, it's around roughly two years, which includes semester one, your semester two, semester three, and also waiting for your results, your final results, and also UPU results. Next, please. So regarding assessment methods, nowadays, I think since 2013, the uh, assessment methods, especially for exams, has changed. So instead of something like SPM, where you have to study everything that you have to know in two years and then take a, fi a final important exams, STPM nowadays uh, is separated into three semesters. So you have three semesters after you learn everything in one semester, you will take a centralized exam. So that will uh, you will do that for three semesters. And the good thing about STPM now is you are given the opportunity to resit for your semester one and semester two exams if you feel that you want to improve on your grades. 
or let's say you failed the exam, you are able to receipt for the exam. And as you all know, you might or might not know, but STPM is a rather academic based uh, pre u course. So your final results, 90% of it uh, is from your exams. And the rest of the 10% comes from your coursework. Uh, when we're talking about coursework, it depends, uh, the number varies uh, depending on the subject. So some requires one coursework per semester, while others might need you to do one for the entire duration of your studies. And also it includes lab work as well if you are taking uh, science subjects. So what you uh, what can what you can imagine is something like what you would do in SPM. So you have lab works as well. And something I would like to touch on as well is UPU criteria because I believe that uh, those who are thinking of taking STPM, you are looking to enter public university. So to uh, for your UPU results, 90% of it comes from your academics, while 10% comes from your extracurricular activities. Next. Okay, next we're talking about estimated costs. Uh, STPM, I would say, is one of the most affordable pre courses here in Malaysia. So everything, when you add everything up, uh, it will cost you I would say less than a thousand. But the only thing I would say is compulsory that you have to uh, take out the money to uh, is for your Malaysian University English test or MWEC. It's kind of like IELTS or TOEFLs. Uh, it's basically an English assessment test for you to enter public universities or uh, private universities in Malaysia. Regarding textbooks and reference books, all these, uh, it is not included. So it's not like SPM where the government will provide you with textbooks. You're required to buy your own textbooks or get it from your relatives who has previously taken SP STPM. So it can range from zero to hundreds of, or hundreds of ringgit. And another thing that I would like to mention is since you're able to receive for your examination, if you would like to take uh, receipt for your exam, it is 50 ringgit per subject that you want to retake. Um, and then the other costs that you might have to think of that I didn't mention are things like transportation fees, uh, if you're taking the MRT, things like that, and also for uniforms. For personally, for my, for my school, we are required to wear formal wear, so collared uh, shirt, uh, button up shirts, uh, slacks, blouses, dresses. So these are some of the costs that you might also have to uh, think about. Next. So regarding subjects, uh, minim you can take a minimum of four subjects, which is usually what the schools or colleges will offer you. Four subjects in a package, like SPM, you have different packages. So they have a set of different subjects for you to choose from. So it's usually four subjects to a maximum of five subjects. For my school, personally, for the fifth subject, uh, you, uh, you have to get extra tutoring from outside in order to take that subject. So different uh, institutions will have offered different courses, but the uh, compulsory subject is pengajian am general studies, while the others are just mix and matches. Next, so here are the list of uh, courses that I can find, list of subjects that I can find from the internet. So plus or minus, some uh, institutions uh, offer different subjects. Next. So STPM is internationally recognized. This is actually uh, well respected. So if you're thinking of applying for scholarships or if you're thinking of study of studying abroad after your pre-U, STPM is actually quite a good choice for you. Next. 
So what are the pros, I would say, uh, if you're taking STPM? Firstly, definitely is affordable. You don't have to pay any tuition, tuition fee. There's no exam fees except for MUET. And you don't have to pay for extra accommodation because you will most likely be studying in an institution near, near you. Secondly, it is internationally recognized. It is well accepted by other countries. So if you're thinking of studying abroad, definitely you can do so. Thirdly, I would say is the modular format nowadays by STPM. So it's separated into three semesters. So it is more focused, I would say. You learn everything that you have to know in one semester and then you take a centralized exam at the end. So for example, for me, I took physics. And so for semester two, we're only learning electrical and electric components. So you learn everything that you have to know, and then you take an exam. And also, you also have the opportunity to improve your grades for semester one and semester two, if you wish to do so. And number four, this is only for my personal experience. I'm not too sure if it is so in other institutions, but for me, uh, I study in rather small classes, so it is quite a focused group and the teachers can actually really focus on each and every student and really get to be close with your teachers and your classmates. So, uh, for example, my, my class, there are only 18 students and in a maximum of 25 students per class in my particular college. I think I feel like this is great if you're looking uh, for guidance, especially because you're able to reach your teachers pretty easily. If you just look for them in a the staff room, or if you have any questions, you can approach them really easily. Next. Now we're moving on to the cons. Well, this can be a good thing or a bad thing. But number one thing I have to warn you that it is a challenging course. I would say it is pretty challenging, but is it doable? Yes, it is doable. So, and if you're thinking, wow, STPM is so hard. I didn't even do well in SPM. How can I take STPM and do well? No, don't trap yourself in that mindset that you can't do well. There are a lot of examples and students who didn't really do that well in SPM, but they excelled in their STPM studies. So although it is challenging, if you're dedicated and you study and you put your hard work into it, you can definitely do well. Number two, it is time consuming. Like I said, it takes about two years. I know just now Lin Xiang uh, has talked about uh, being able to graduate and enter the workforce really early uh, compared to your peers. I have friends who took OSMED and they're about to uh, graduate from their degree next year while I am still here um, and I haven't entered a uni yet, I haven't started my degree. So that is something that you have to think about if you would like to enter the workforce early. I don't think this is a suitable course for you. Number three, you'll still be stuck in a very much in a school environment. You'll be studying in an SMK setting. So your classes, uh, your labs, everything you'll be doing in like an SMK setting. So if you're thinking of, wow, uh, once I graduate SPM, I want to have that campus life. I want to go to Sunway, Taylor's, uh, you, you won't be getting that. And you still, there's still compulsory uh, extracurricular activities that you have to do. So one badan uniform, one club persatuan, and one sukan. So all these you you have to, all these are compulsory for you to take. And number four, I would have to warn you, there are a lot of examples as well of students who excel. They got a four point oh CGPA for their STPM, but they cannot enter their desired course in public university. It is very competitive, I would say, especially for hot courses like medicine or veterinary, engineering. These courses are really competitive and you really have to 
do well. And even if you do well, you might not be able to enter that particular course that you want to in the particular university that you want to. So that is something you might have to think about. Next. So is it right for you? Firstly, I think it's suitable for people if you're looking for a cost-effective pre-U course. You are up for the challenge, definitely. If you wish to enter public university, this is one of the uh, routes and uh, choices for you. And number four, you want more time, a little bit more time to decide on what degree you want to pursue, what you want to study, and uh, what, uh, what career that you want to do next time. Next. So a little bit, uh, some words of advice. Number one, I would say be consistent. Definitely, definitely be consistent. Take the time to understand the topics well, because even if you do a lot of past years, if you don't understand the topics, you won't be able to answer the exam questions. Do not study last minute. A lot of people study last minute. I know like if you study last minute, you can still get an A for SPM, but you cannot do that in STPM. You have to study and you have to study consistently. Number two, find a suitable study technique. This is a great time for you to find uh, a study technique that works for you because uh, the duration for your studies is actually quite short. In six months, then you have to take an exam that does not include like uh, holidays that you have. So you definitely have to pick up and learn quickly and to study well. So my advice would be do trial and pass your papers as well and to understand your topics well. Number three, I would say do also take the time to make uh, form meaningful connections with friends, your teachers, because uh, one and a half years is actually, it goes by really quickly. So I met a lot of great people in Form 6. So definitely take the time and get to know new friends and, you know, people and your teachers. And lastly, I would say work hard, um, play hard, manage your time well. Uh, <laughs> A lot of teachers will tell you, don't, don't, don't play. Okay, you only study, only study in Form 6. You have plenty of time to play in uni. Uh, don't play now. You have, you study, study. And like, I also have teachers who are advising us to drop science, especially if you're a science students, the teachers will tell you, uh, are you sure you want to take science? If you cannot do it, then you have to change to art stream or don't take STPM. It's very difficult. Yeah, you'll go through that phase. As for, like that, that was my experience. But I believe that if you can manage your time well, you can still have fun while studying. Next. So here are just some pictures that I want to show you from my Form 6 life. So we have a lot of activities, um, events, talks. Uh, co-curriculum activities. So definitely there's is a fun time, even though it comes with a lot of stress as well. <laughs> so I think that's about it. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mungti. Uh, we will move on to uh, Q&A sessions for STPM. So for STPM, the first one there, when would STPM students uh, sit for MWET normally? Hmm. For me, I think it was around June. So it's more towards the beginning of the year, I believe. During your semester two. Uh, during your semester two. Uh, is when we would usually take more. You you are you can take more earlier. There's a there's another exam earlier but usually if you want to take it with your friends especially uh, and you have to practice your oral with your friends so usually you'll take it at the same time 
Okay, we have uh, another two questions for STPM. Uh, the next one would be, how do you juggle between extra co-curricular activities and academics for STPM? Ooh, that is a good question. I would say, yes, extracurricular activities is important, but for, for my school, especially, I would say, the teachers are pretty uh, understanding they know that academics is the bulk of your STPM results. So usually, yes, you have to have extracurricular activities. You're required to plan projects, uh, meetings, and all that. But usually during uh, the time period when it's nearing exams, the teachers are really understanding and they will let you study instead and focus on let you focus on your studies. So I think that is uh that is great for you for students uh the last one for stpm would you recommend stpm for law hmm. would i recommend stpm for law i would say um, i can't speak for law students because i took science but i do have friends who are looking to take law uh, who are doing STPM. So I think uh, if you are looking to enter a Malaysian a public university for law, I think STPM is a good choice for you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Munti, for the STPM sharing session. Uh, next one, we will have our... Q&A sessions, which is open to all speakers. So there's one here earlier that uh, we didn't manage to uh, answer. So I think it's about OSMED. Uh, is Sunway University, there's AT and GT subjects. Is there a difference? So Natalie? Uh, okay, so can you guys hear me? Sorry, can you yeah. hear me? Okay. So for AD subjects, it basically means ATA subjects. And for GT subjects, it basically means general subjects. So as I've mentioned just now in OSNET, we have to take five subjects, but only your four best score subjects will be accounted into your final ATA score. So in MCKL, uh, MCKL only offers AT subjects, which is ATA subjects. So for my five subject combination, uh, I'm required to take five uh, subjects. And then, uh, wait, wait, sorry, I'll give you an example. So let's say I take five AT subjects and one GT subject. My final score will only revolve around my AT subjects and my GT subject will just be like a fifth subject which will not be accounted into my final score. So the G you need to keep in mind that the GT subject is not account it couldn't be accounted into your final score even though you have a high mark for your GT subject. So uh, advantage of like taking both ATA subjects and GT subjects is that uh, GT subject is not that, not as difficult as ATA subjects, whereas because uh, ATA subject is very deep uh, in, as compared to the GT subjects. Yeah. Okay, I hope that answers the questions. Uh, okay, we have two uh, general questions here, uh, overall Q and A's. Yeah, so open to all speakers. How would you decide your pre U programs out of so many options, and still have no ideas what to study? So maybe we could have I don't know maybe uh one or two speakers in general. Whoever can volunteer to answer this uh question. All right, I Anyone? think I can start first. Okay, yeah, Joyton, sure. Okay, so um, to be honest, right, the first thing that you have to know is, oh, let me open my camp. Right. Okay, so the first thing that you have to realize is uh, where does your interest lie? So for instance, like some people, if they already have a specific interest in mind, for example, if they want to study medicine, if they want to study law, then I recommend you to go into more specific courses like foundations or diplomas, because that way it offers you a more direct path to your degree. Okay. So um, the next thing is, uh, the second thing that you have to take, keep in mind is that, let's say if you don't have a direction now, like you don't know what you want to study in your university, then what I recommend is you choose the most economical option there is out there. So for instance, if you think that economically you can support 
A level, then sure you can go to A level because why not, right? If you have the luxury to afford for it and go to overseas. But let's say if maybe this kind of options are not that economically viable for you, then maybe I recommend you to take something like STPM or matriculacy, something like that, right? And um, another thing is it depends on how well you can cope with stress because ultimately every single pre-university program has like, you know, different amount of materials that you need to study. Some, like for example, matriculacy, they don't go that deep into each and every subject. Whereas in A-levels, you actually go into very deep. So it really depends on how well you can cope with everything, I'll say. So ultimately, again, I, I, was, I will say that there's like a, you definitely have to choose this or that, right? There's no definite answer to this. It still depends on you ultimately. So yeah, that's my response. Okay, thank you, Joyton. Maybe we could have one more speaker uh, to talk about his or uh, her opinion. Anyone could go, yeah. Uh, maybe I can share a bit about myself. La. So um, how I decided yeah. on ICAW is that, yeah, like what I mentioned in my presentation just now, like, yeah, when I picture myself, like what, what do I want to be? I don't necessarily know what industry that I want to go in yet, go into it yet, but I'm like, kind of sure that I would be in the corporate, I would I would want to work in the corporate setting. So yeah, I did my research on that side and then yeah, and in the end I decided on ICAW. ICAW. Yeah, actually I was considering between yeah. ICAW and ACCA also, but then yeah, there was a scholarship available, like I mentioned available just now, for like ICAW. ICAW. That's why I chose that one. So that, that's why I chose the course. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I hope uh, to whoever that asked that question answers yours. And I believe the next questions we have here is for Mungti. Do the counselors provide support for university placement, especially for international universities for STPM? And before that, uh, regarding the previous question, our speaker Nabil also give his opinion there, so maybe you can read through there. Okay, sure. Uh, Mungti, yeah, your answer, please. All right. So regarding counselor support, uh, I'm actually not too sure about that. Uh, personally, uh, there uh, isn't there isn't specific support, especially for international universities. But I believe that the counselors the school would be happy to give you some advice uh, when it comes to uh, your degree choices or your uni choices. Um, I believe STPM will be more focused on public universities, but if you're interested, I feel that for my for my personal uh, experience as well, the counselors are quite, uh, quite supportive uh, and quite helpful. So I'm sure they will have some yeah, advice for you yeah. if you were to approach them. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, I have Rosin. So can you apply to public universities like UM Law after doing foundation in a private program like MMU? Yes. Yeah, yes, yes, you can. There are many seniors who do that. So as long as your results are good enough, you can. But before your foundation, do make sure that you check the requirements for UM so that you get into it. But yeah, you can. Okay. Basically, uh, private university foundations are uh, also you could apply to public universities for degree as long as you apply under UPU. So I hope that is clear. Uh, the next question we have here, to choose course for our study, which is more important, job scope or dreams? Could we have uh, someone or anyone to answer? Maybe uh, Tariq, if you're here, or Lina, or Nabil, anyone who haven't answered? I would like to give my opinion like regarding this question, uh, which is more important yeah. is it job scope or our dreams. Um, 
You know, uh, I think if we want to look into the present right now, I think it's better for us to actually look into the job scope lah. Because most of my friends, they never really learn computer science, but they said they decided to go for it because they knew in the future that we are going to uh, be involved in the computer science field even more. But for me personally, I think I would like to go for my dreams. Um, I think if you have something that you are interested in then if there is a will then there is a way for it so but it also depends on you but uh, some of my friends decided to sacrifice their dreams to help their family some of them have a very financially support parents so they just go for their dreams so i think it depends on you as an individual that's all for me that's all for me. thank you lina good advice there so and in the end, it depends on you whether you choose a job scope or your dreams, okay? or vice versa. So I think there is no more questions. Uh, yeah, no more questions. So I'd like to thank you, uh, speakers, all of you here today for taking your time in joining us, uh, in sharing your uh, experience and knowledge about your own free universities program. Uh, also, thank you to all participants who join us today, uh, either via Google Meet or YouTube Live. So I hope all of you here today have gained some useful information that you can use in deciding your uh, pre-U programs once the SPM results or I, uh, IG's result is out. So before we end, uh, we would like to take a group uh, photos. Uh, if everyone could turn on their camera, that's good. Uh, especially the speakers and the committee and the participants too if you're not shy to the picture okay so sure. yeah so maybe you could take picture yeah so everyone smile one two three okay another one one two three okay so uh, that's the end of our workshop today, Choices Ahead, Introduction to Free U Programs. On behalf of the committees and tutors in Action Malaysia, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to speakers and participants uh, again in joining and supporting our workshop. Thank you so much. Uh, don't forget to join us uh, next week for the second part of Choices Ahead workshop where we will be talking about uh, scholarship experience sharing on the 20th and 21st of May, uh, 10, 30 and 2 p.m. both days. Okay, I think that's all. Uh, maybe uh, speakers, we can uh, leave for a while. I mean, uh, stay back for a while for another round of only speakers uh, photo. Uh, other than that, yeah, thank you so much. I uh, hope to see you guys next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, yep, you're welcome.